Strategy Strategy is defined as the purposeful attempt to gain an advantage over your opponent. In the end, strategy is the name of the game, no matter what the game is. Today, play ball becomes start the clock. What a play becomes what a move. And you're out of there becomes checkmate. The Cleveland Guardians Chess Club takes center stage as teammates become opponents. Will Stephen Kwan's plate discipline translate on the board? Tanner Bybee paint the corners with precise brilliancies. Bo Naylor play backstop to all the blunders. Austin Hedges catch his opponent sleeping. Scott Barlow close out the end game. Will Brennan drive one through the ranks. Daniel Schneeman scoop up loose pieces. Or Tristan McKenzie strike out the side. Only one can have 162 games of locker room bragging rights. So dig in and swing for the fences. Live from spring training, this is Slug Champs, Cleveland Guardians. And it starts right now. We are trading home runs and strikeouts for tactics and perhaps blunders. This is the Guardians chess team, the Cleveland Guardians of Major League Baseball. We are live from spring training in Goodyear, Arizona. You see the desert is hot. Will the player's chess be able to live up to the heat? That is the big question. And today we will have eight contestants from the team, the Cleveland Guardians. You see players, they're getting set on screen from the live venue in Goodyear, Arizona. And well, it's going to be a fun event, that's for sure. This is Slow Champs. I'm Grandmaster Robert Hess. Alongside me today is Grandmaster Amon Hamilton. Amon, how pumped are you for Slow Champs to begin? Hey, what's up, Robert? What's up, everyone? I'm excited to get into a show which should be a lot of fun today. You know, we always do these professional shows on chess.com. Now we get to uh, let our hair down. And I mean, my two favorite worlds, sports and chess, are colliding, Robert. So I'm excited to get into it today. I'm super pumped myself. And we do have some breaking news. The event hasn't even started yet. But we have to alert everybody. It's not trades. It's nothing like that. But Scott Barlow, uh, he was a late scratch here from Goodyear, Arizona. And taking his place will be David Fry. So both players, they don't have uh, much history on chess.com. But mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that they haven't been able to uh, take part in some serious chess competition before. That's right. I think, you know, for all the sports fans that are watching this chess broadcast right now, you scared them when, when you said you had breaking news, Robert. But... I think, honestly, coming into this event and not having prepared at all could actually be kind of a nice thing for, for David. He's got no expectations, and from what I've heard, the guys in the locker room are saying he's kind of a dark horse for the event, so watch it. Those are the whispers from the clubhouse. They see him as a threat, and this event, it will be in a time control of five minutes with zero seconds added after every turn. No increment, and Amon, you know, this is... Uh, an event where players they get to play at least three matches that's the good news but i can't get over five minutes plus no seconds of increment it's a best of four games in each round we're gonna see some serious flagging we are and you know what i do love the format even if uh you know one of these players suffers a loss at the hands of uh, one of their teammates they're going to be coming back because they play all the way up to the consolation bracket so lots of chess to be played wins or losses but, but as you mentioned no increment yep. i mean I even don't envy myself when I'm playing uh, Blitz Chess with no any problem. So these guys who are more beginner chess players, I'm just going to say good luck. <laughs> good skill, good luck. They're going to need it. And these are professionals in baseball. So they're professional athletes. Uh, they're used to getting the job done. We see a mix of positions here. We have catchers, pitchers, outfielders, the whole. A rotation almost filled and this event literally started out of left field because Stephen Kwan the two-time gold glove winner he's the reason this event is happening among he's quite a serious chess player he is yeah Stephen Kwan really kind of just set this whole event up this slug champ that's happening today with the Cleveland Guardians and obviously he's got a background in chess you can see his chess.com blitz rating there 937 but you know, I feel like uh, to put the proper respect on his name, Robert, i got to talk about his accolades in baseball first. Two-time gold glove winner, 
2022-2023, and I mean, I mean, Robert, this is a guy who not only excels in baseball, but is looking to uh, also win this tournament as one of the favorites in the event. And Stephen Kwan, he led MLB rookies in 2022 with most hits and runs. That's not something that happens by accident. So he can get it done on both sides and from hitting and from the field. So Man, I mean, this is a legend in the making mm -hmm. on the field, but also somebody who truly loves chess. And he is the reason that this event came together. Exactly. I, I think that an event like this is always sparked by just a true passion, right? Uh, someone, you know, infects everyone else in a good way in, in the clubhouse. And you can't play chess uh, just on your own. Uh, Chess.com app is great for that, Robert. But you got to get some of your buddies and teammates involved and look how it's flourished into a much larger event that we have here today. And you have to love this, that uh, the Cleveland's John Marshall High School, the chess team, they did well at the Nationals. And then the Guardians, and Stephen Kwan in particular, they took notice, they invited the students to Progressive Field. Since then, the baseball players and the students that continue to face off against one another, that's a feel-good story if I've ever heard one of mine. That's awesome. Yeah, just connecting with the community, uh, especially the students there. That chess club is never gonna forget that. And obviously you, you take one small step there and Everyone pays it forward. So that's that's how the game of uh, chess and these two worlds continues to grow and collide. And they play chess uh, all the time amongst each other in the clubhouse, but with uh, these students. And it's really uh, beautiful to see that chess is growing all across the globe. And this event today, Slug Champs, it will feature these eight Cleveland Guardians athletes. And they're doing it not just for bragging rights and pride, but among for charities, both local and international. It's great to see that these players support their causes. Indeed, and you know, the great thing about an event like this is uh, no matter who wins, there's a winner, right? Everyone wins at the end of the day, uh, but all these players have a unique charity that they're supporting. So uh, there'll be some, I think, a little bit more on the line than just bragging rights, uh, Robert, because all of these uh, players, of course, uh, want to uh, see the money go to a great place. And there's something more on the line than just their pride. And I think that these players, they'll all try to contend for this championship. And while well, they come from different chess backgrounds, we see in yellow on the left-hand side that David Fry has no game history on chess.com. He's the true <laughs> wild card. But Amon, I think those red highlights, uh, they stand out. Bo Naylor, Bo knows. He's played the most amount of games on chess.com. That's nearly 2,500 games. But it's Stephen Kwan with the highest blitz rating. The best win, though, belongs to Daniel Schneeman. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, lots of names there standing out. And of course, when you're dealing with ratings from 400 uh, up to 1,000, I think you'd probably agree the variance is super high. So, you know, 400 could take out the top rated player in this event today, which is why I think every round in this tournament is going to be really, really exciting. And you mentioned the best win there. Although it's uh, there for uh, Daniel Schneeman, the, the thing about best win is, you know, you get to know some players have really high ceilings, but some of these players might also have really low floors. So it should be wild no matter what. And we see our bracket. This is the quarterfinal matchups. Uh, Stephen Kwan against Tristan McKenzie, Austin Hedges against David Fry, Bo Naylor against Will Brennan, and Daniel Schneeman against Tanner Bybee. So these are our opening matchups. Amon, we heard that from the clubhouse, uh, some of the players, they were particularly happy. Others maybe facing a bit of a rival. Let's uh, look at the players as they reacted to finding out the bracket. Oh, Let's go. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Scotty? So me versus T Mac, Hog versus Barlow, Bo versus Will, and Shima versus Bybee. Damn, that wow. well, last one's good. Bro, that's, I a, need, that's, I a, good that's, that's a good one. I need you to read those. What's your chest of comedy? Oh, good. good. I don't know strategies. I just I know how the pieces. Uh, just, just go on. I'm not Hey, that's the best part. That being said, I did take my queen against him yesterday and like basically just like put it somewhere. Yeah, you did like an L and a diagonal. And 
as we get set. You see the players on camera. Uh, that video was courtesy of Gabriela Cruz, and she is on site with the players, kind of our eyes and ears on the ground. We look forward to checking in with her a little bit later. But Amon, uh, this is, I think, the site that everyone came here to see. These eight baseball players, and now it's now or never for them because the action is about to begin. Yeah, I see we do have some moves underway. We have the, uh, I guess, the aerial view uh, here of all the games in progress. And as we mentioned, there's going to be so many matches. Even if you see, you know, your favorite player today lose, trust me, they're going to be playing again. And uh, the game we have up right now, uh, let's call it our featured matchup, Robert. We got Stephen Kwan and uh, Tristan McKenzie here. I wonder what kind of preparation these players have done because Stephen Kwan, he trots out the Scotch game and Tristan yep. McKenzie, he was a little bit he was deliberate in his reply and he did capture twice. So he allowed the queen into the center. Amon, for our newer audience members, queen usually is bad in the center if it can yep. be kicked around, but there's nothing black can use at the moment to kick that queen out of there. Exactly. And so you'll often see newer players really tempted by a move like pawn to c5 as we see the... Uh, Potential already for a uh, thrust in the center here. Pawn to e5, Robert, would already attack two pieces. But you know what? I think Stephen Kwan, he's not looking to punish early on. I think he just knows where his pieces belong. He's getting them out to good squares. Uh, Tristan McKenzie, we lost him on camera uh, for a moment. But look at this. Amon, you called it. Stephen Kwan, we can tell he's a serious player. He played the yep. Scotch game, which is not regularly featured at the beginner level. So he has the experience. He wanted this tournament for a reason. He wants to take first place. Yeah, this is reminding me of, you know, like the Magnus Carlsen GOAT uh, Invitational. <laughs> like he just created a tournament, brought all his teammates here, and he's planning to crush them all. <laughs> this is a great idea from him. And we saw him trade queens, trade some minor pieces. He is yeah. ahead. He has an extra knight for just one pawn. So for those of you who are newer to chess, you're taught to trade when you're ahead. And I mean, I'm on every move with purpose thus far. Totally. I'm waiting to see if he's going to castle and which way. Um, I would certainly go queenside here to bring the rook into the middle. But white has pawns uh, pretty much everywhere except the two uh, files in the middle of the board. So I suspect he's going to bring his two rooks there as soon as possible. So far, so good for the uh, highest rated player in the competition in Stephen Kwan. So, you know, when you look at the ratings, some players, they're probably a bit underrated, don't have the mm -hmm. games uh, behind them. But I think for Stephen Kwan, we're seeing that maybe you know he's underrated because he has great understanding. Perhaps time can be an yep. issue, not necessarily in this game, but as this uh, event continues, Amon, perhaps that will be uh, the demon for him. And we'll continue to remind our viewers that there is no increment on these games. So it's pure five-minute chess. And the other thing that I thought might be interesting here, Robert, is that, you know, there's an element of psychology as well. These guys are, you know, in the same locker room together. They probably played games against each other. So, yeah, they've got their individual strengths. But they also might be really good against certain players just because of how they get along with each other. It's true. You know, when you play a friend, it could be a good experience where no matter what happens, you're happy. Or it could be like, oh, I've got to get the best of them. And you don't want to be overly subjective when you're playing chess. But I think Tristan McKenzie deserves some credit, too. I mean, his moves have been uh, quite solid. He did lose a piece early on. That was unfortunate for him. But I think since then, he's been playing mostly solid moves. Although when you're down a night against someone like Stephen Kwan, you're probably going to pay the full price. Yeah, he's kind of teeter-tottering back and forth to this f6 square but now the king can't go to e7 so i think he's getting exactly what he wants rook takes d7 and i wonder are we going to see the other rook come down what's going to be the next move because robert there is a sneaky idea here to trap white's bishop so stephen could actually overextend if he's not careful if he brings that second rook to the seventh rank i mean we know he's in this for the championship title on that alone. Yeah. That is a powerful move. He can just safely move his bishop away to take a pawn at the end of its diagonal. There's no harm in that, but bringing that second rook into the attack, oh, this is also a nice wow. move trading off pieces. So he, he's clearly a good player. Definitely. Yeah, he's uh, liquidating so that the only thing left is going to maybe be his, his one knight. And we'll see if he gets some trades in here. He seems to understand that concept that when you have something extra trade everything else equally and of course you'll just be left with that knight at the end 
in an easily winning game. The one thing to avoid if you're white, you don't have any pawn pushes in front of your king. And now that the rook has left the first rank Amon, yep. there's no way we'll see a back rank checkmate, right? I hope we see rook d8 just to test that out because, you know, Steven's got to prove himself here. And moment of truth. There's no way. There's oh, no way. Wow. That's, that's, that's a professional move. That's like, I know exactly what I'm doing. Escape square on h2. Hey, Robert, rook d2, and all these pawns start disappearing. I could still see black winning this game. <laughs> Do you see Tristan? He just picked up a green pawn and was pushing <laughs> it forward. That's what he hopes his queenside pawns will do, because you know he's going after uh, the c2 and then b2, and uh, that black pawn on c5, that can start rumbling down the board. So I, I, I of course... We'll look at the eval bar. White is winning. Stephen Kwan's playing a great game, but there are some chances here for Black. Totally. I, I think the other funny thing to remember as if he sees this one moving backwards, he could take it. I was going to say in the actual clubhouse, they're sitting like directly across from one another for the most part. So um, <laughs> these guys could also just be kind of looking across like, hey, what are you up to over there? Oh, I think we know what Stephen Kwan's up to. He's... Uh... Uh, forking around there. Knight takes c2. He just forked the king and, and rook. And that knight could have been grabbed him on. He left it hanging there for a moment too long. And now mm -hmm. it feels like mop-up duty. Yeah. I think if he pushes the pawn forward, there's, you know, rook takes pawn here. King takes that pawn. I could still see black winning. Call me crazy, Robert. <laughs> but I'm just saying it's actually easier for Tristan McKenzie to play because he's only got a couple things to move. That is true. It's funny to say that when someone's up a rook, but you're making a, a fair argument, I would say. And we do have a result in. It looks like uh, Austin Hedges beat David Fry with the white pieces. And I heard that you know, Hedgie was a bit upset. That uh, Not upset, it's too strong. But he was saying that David Fry, uh, he's good. So I don't want to play yeah. him. It's not fair that he's the replacement. I don't think that there were any issues for Austin Hedges, at least in game one. Yep. And you can see all the... All the players reacting to the results there. Steven Kwan, I, he's in this weird spot because he's totally winning. And he's up a rook. And he knows it. But at the same time, you have to be a little bit accurate. One wrong move here, and he'll, he could de definitely mess this up. Or he can make a three-time repetition if you keep moving your rook and the, the king shuffles back and forth for everyone who's unfamiliar that if the same position happens three mm -hmm. different times, the game ends in a draw. And the white king... It, it's getting closer, but it can't stop the pawn. So That's the right. rook has to sacrifice itself right now. But Amon, then the black king will go right back. This is going to be a pawn race. <laughs> he gets a knight. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then he takes it anyway. <laughs> oh, and he, look at this. This is wonderful from Steven, actually. He's chasing down that very dangerous pawn. If he brings his king in contact with the b4 pawn, he gets the job done. But Amon, who promotes to a knight there? That's hilarious. Yeah, he promoted to a knight and it got taken anyway. Tristan's giving up his last pawn there. I wonder if he intentionally did that or if he just clicked, you know, whatever the heck he wanted to when he had the option. <laughs> that was quite amusing. And it looks like, by the way, Bo Naylor also won the first game, as did Schneeman. So the white pieces. It's going to be a 4 nil sweep from these players. What's Steve Kwan doing with the camera, by the way? Yeah, I wonder. He's uh, also, of course, another big part of the game is, you know, avoiding stalemate, especially for newer players to chess. You feel like at this point you can only win, but that's not the case. He's got 33 seconds, Robert, and I wouldn't call it over just yet. Although, did I just see a pre-move? Because if I did, then I'm starting to feel more confident. I think they're talking trash to each other, and I, I really don't get what's happening mm -hmm. on top of the camera. It's like you put uh, a, the camera on top of a DJ set, and that's what the <laughs> view we have is. Yeah, it's almost like uh, they're playing on a tablet, a touch screen, you know? <laughs> oh, that would be something. Whoa, but look, what a checkmate you... there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was close to being a stalemate if he didn't find the checkmate, and he gets it done with just over 20 seconds. And uh, Tristan McKenzie, he's booing him. He clapped him. And then he's uh, giving him the booze. So it's, uh, <laughs> he's given a bit of everything. Yeah. The, uh, you know, just a friendly uh, little rivalry there between the guys. But ultimately, Stephen Kwan as the favorite in this first game does 
uh, collect the win there, and <laughs> you can see him on camera. <laughs> oh, these players having a good time. That was the moment where Tristan McKenzie was joking on pawn pushes, but we see all the players. Uh, they had their reactions during the game, some laughing. Some probably won't be laughing quite as much uh, when the match is over, but it's really good to see them uh, enjoying the game of chess. Totally. Yeah, you see uh, all the guys seem to be having a great time. That's what the event is all about. Um, and I said, honestly, they're combining sports there. I think I just saw a football throw of uh, the chess.com pawn there. Maybe that's your mind because that's a baseball throw. But what we have seen is a clean sweep for the players with the white pieces. Stephen Kwan, Austin Hedges, Bo Naylor, Daniel Schneeman all win with white. And well, Mon, that's not completely unexpected because those were the higher rated players in their matchups. I was going to say, uh, did, w was this really because of the white pieces? Like, these guys are such <laughs> professionals that it's like win with white, you know, work work hard with the black pieces. Uh, we'll see if the black pieces can make a comeback because I would actually say the opposite, Robert. I would say that the white pieces don't matter that much for, uh, for these ratings. That is usually the case that unlike in uh, the Super Grandmaster tournaments where you say, oh, draw with black, win with white, it does not matter as much. And we do have liftoff in game two. I'm looking at the top right of our screen. Mm -hmm. Austin Hedges just forked the knight and bishop of David Fry. So whatever talk was happening beforehand with the late scratch and the replacement as David yep. Fry steps in, I think maybe he needed a little bit more time to work on the chess. Yeah, unfortunately in, in that one, he's already going to be down a piece. The queen comes out super early in that game. And yeah, looking at all of them, only the top two have actually begun. And I think Austin, as you mentioned, he, he wants to make a statement to Davis. He says, you, you're going to join the event late? I'm going to remind you that I, I've been putting in some work. Yeah, no, this is a, a one of those funny matches where, you know, at first someone is afraid and then they get into the swing. They say, Maybe I shouldn't have been so worried uh, just because somebody is a last minute replacement. And I don't uh -huh. know what kind of preparation they've been doing, but I think that uh, Austin Hedges, it seems like he's played the first game very nicely. And okay, here he has a big opportunity to go after the white king. Absolutely. Yeah. Either one of these checks have a similar idea of hitting the knight and delivering a check to the king, but hey, you can't fault someone for just playing to the center of the board. That's that's a great way to approach the game of chess. And Austin Hedges has won a World Series. So he was on the Guardians. He left, won a ring, and is back. So it's, uh, you know, for him, it's probably fun to be back with these teammates and getting to enjoy the game of chess with them. Uh, you know, when you are separated for a bit, I think it's nice to have this kind of bonding experience. Well, he's having a great experience with uh, David Fry's pieces here. He's collected a couple of them so far. That knight was just free. I imagine David's probably going to grab this bishop here. Yep. One thing I, I don't see people able to refuse is the temptation to take something. Whether it's free or just a trade, always take something if it's in front of you. <laughs> yeah, that is definitely what newer players do. And in this position, white needs to develop. I mean, his king is in the center. His bishop and rook are not uh, moving. And so he does push his king's pawn. And I think both players now uh, have a handle of things. It's just unfortunate for David that he is down uh, a couple minor pieces. So he is down two knights for just one pawn. Yeah, I think actually the first game that we saw between uh, Steven and his opponent there I think that game actually was the first glimpse of maybe time pressure because these these guys are playing so quick, Robert. I haven't seen anyone at risk of flagging, which is when your clock actually reaches zero. That, that hasn't been close to happen. And we've seen this in all of our athletes' blitz champs in the past where uh, sometimes they just blitz it out instantly yeah you're playing a five minute game there isn't that much time but it's like they're playing a five second game they're just making moves very quickly and it could be nerves it could be inexperience or it could be because they love bullet chess <laughs> that's right yeah these guys uh could just be bullet speed demons in the background secretly and oops uh, a piece goes back towards david fry so he's got a bit more of a of a chance here as we go back to the bird's eye view and Get a glimpse of all these games in progress here, Robert. Any of these uh, 
stand out to you? I'm I'm looking at most of them and thinking, okay, the black pieces are making a bit of a comeback here. Well, looking at the games from left to right, I'll start in the bottom right corner. It looks like Daniel Schneeman is, is getting it done uh, in that game. And then we're looking in the uh, top right. We saw Austin Hedges um, mm -hmm. going for that game. And then in the bottom left, well, that one actually looks quite interesting. I don't entirely agree with the evaluation bar in that one saying black is better between Bo Naylor and Will Brennan. So maybe we should dive into that game. Amon, uh, well, it looks like one player lost their camera. But that game, it does seem to be one where it's not going to be one-sided traffic. Yeah, absolutely. Will and Bo here right now. And we're already seeing some backwards night moves. That's, that's just classy right there. Yeah, maybe we'll get back to that game. I mean, so many of them are great choices. But yeah, the backwards knight move, the bishop is in some trouble, Amon, but maybe it can hide in enemy territory at some point. Yeah, I feel like the... I don't know if the natural instinct is to go forward or go backwards here, because sometimes it feels like it's safer to go back in your own territory. And I was about to say, bishop a3, b4. A tremendous reaction from Bo, and he had that ready to go. So it was almost like he kind of planned that out, which I mean, to be formulating plans to trap your opponent's pieces already, uh, that says a lot about Bo Naylor as a, as a chess player here. Bo knows, and he knows when to push those pawns, trapping that bishop on a3. Uh, Amon, this has been a great start for him. I mean, it's not like White was playing badly to that point. In mm -hmm. fact, White stole a pawn. But when you take pieces, it means you're often moving the same one couple times it got trapped and now Bo is in charge he is yeah after uh he takes there i mean he's, he's got the hands together he knows he's, he's counting up doing the quick math and saying yep i'm ahead here and even just having that upper hand means you can kind of go on the offensive you just have a, a bigger army to use He's taking better, faster, stronger to heart because he's also way ahead on the clock. Uh, he won that first game, and now he's up material in this second game. So it's unfortunate for Will Brennan, but maybe we should zoom out and check out what's going on in some of our other games just because uh, some of these second games are about to conclude, it would appear, including the one in the top right. Uh, it looks like Austin Hedge is still well ahead and leading on the clock. And then the yep. top left, Stephen Kwan. He is uh, the highest rated player, and it seems like it's for good reason. He is very strong, and the other players will have their hands full with him. Definitely. Yeah, I'm looking at uh, David Fry and Austin Hedges, since that looks like maybe the closest to a potential win. But uh, you can't underestimate uh, anyone in, in these events here. Already, Austin was off to a good start, and... Hey, a really, really impressive tactic in that game there, Robert. That's actually a uh, discovered attack, discovered check. Super impressive to spot that for Austin Hedges there. Wow. And Austin Hedges, you see him, he was leaning back in his chair. He just snagged a rook. But what we're hearing on the ground is that Hedges blundered. He was up a piece. And he actually allowed a freak checkmate that I think will be instructive for our audience members to see. So if we can uh, dive in to um, their game, it would be cool to show everybody that, um, well, Hedges, he did allow a checkmate that was overlooked by Fry. Yeah. Let's, uh, I mean, they're, they're still going here. It looks like Fry is about to lose this one on time, if not, you know, the overwhelming amount of material as well, but we can certainly go back and and try to see exactly which checkmate may have been missed here. And that oh. game is over. <laughs> you see that? <laughs> Arms yeah. are raised. And I think we could see him in the background of Stephen Kwan's camera. There he is. Look at him. Yep. He's behind Kwan. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I actually have that uh, that checkmate as well, if we want to show it, because it's a pretty big moment and it might be something that's instructive for this whole event. It's something for these players to uh, really be careful about. And, you know, I think he's kind of instructing his opponent, which might hurt more. You know, when Andrew Luck, yeah. the former NFL quarterback, his trash shot was being extraordinarily kind to his opposition. I think sometimes that stings more. Yeah, it's true. You, you don't want to be too friendly, too helpful. At the end of the day, it's a competition. These guys are 
playing for bragging rights here. And uh, well, Austin Hedges up two to nothing. Maybe we'll stick on this scene just for now to check out how the other games may end. Daniel Schneeman in the bottom right. Mm -hmm. He is up a knight and has some pawns that are uh, motoring forward. In the bottom left, Bo Naylor still in charge. And in the top left, it's Stephen Kwan. So Amon, we're getting the makings of what might be sweeps in these opening round matches. I think it's just that some players are a bit more experienced and have a a stronger chess background than others. Yeah, and I think one thing that's interesting to note is the players that are simply more familiar with chess.com, with playing online, those are the guys that are having some success here because it's quite a, a, you know, tough experience to just jump into a no increment blitz game and hang with the best of them. So that can be pretty tough for some of the newer players. And we've seen three of these four games end with the win for the player with the black pieces. Mm -hmm. Daniel Schneeman looking to make it four out of four. I don't see his knight anymore in the bottom right, but uh, I do see (laughs) a pass on that can't be stopped. Yep. I'm looking at the time, though. Uh, Even though I might look at 20 seconds and be like, oh, it's loads of time. It's not. 20 seconds ticking down, 35 seconds even. This is not a walk in the park here. No, this is where stalemates happen, mm-hmm. where you don't put the enemy king in check, but has nowhere to go and the game would end as a draw. We've seen that in many of the Pog Champs tournaments. So, Amon, you have to be careful here if you are Daniel Schneeman. Yeah, this king can hide behind the pawns and almost use these guys as a shield. This is going to be a difficult checkmate to make happen. And with the clock the way it is, it seems like uh, Bybee's having trouble making moves, but all he can move is his king. So his moves actually happen more quickly, but that's a ladder checkmate if I've seen one, and you see the sigh of relief from Schneeman. And Schneeman actually looked, uh, you know, he was looking really stressed there. The adrenaline was pumping, Robert. I don't blame him. It's not like he had much time left and he didn't see a checkmate. He probably was worried about stalemating people in front of thousands of audience members. So it was a a win for Schneeman. There's uh, Bo. And we have uh, some good matches on our hands, but the higher rated players, they've been dominant thus far. Yeah, this is uh, definitely what you could expect on paper, but I still think we're in for some upsets when it comes to the ratings they don't tell the the full picture but for now you know the the favorites are are on top in the early stages yes they are and it's two nothing uh, for the higher rated more experienced players but there could be a comeback and you see the players (laughs) celebrating that is awesome some of these reactions have been great but they're also distracting their teammates and fellow (laughs) competitors by dancing around in the background yeah i've heard Uh, or seeing rather some of the players in a critical moment all of a sudden looking up because someone else is celebrating like they just won the world series this is great to see and you mentioned it robert the favorites up 2-0 in their respective series uh great start for them has anyone in particular impressed you this far among honestly i i think just as a general note what i have been impressed by from all the players from the uh, moments that i've seen is the conversions Usually what happens is one side gets an advantage and is it, you can so easily mess that up or fail to checkmate and stalemate instead. We have not seen that. So I'm just going to give uh, you know credit to the entire uh, Guardians team, uh, all the Slug Champs uh, participants here, Robert, because that is impressive. And I mean that seriously. Most of the... Uh, memorable clippable moments have been from players making mistakes in winning positions so you're right that the conversion has been pretty smooth for these players Uh, the next game is going to begin shortly for all of these eight mlb players and i just want to give them another shout out for taking their talents away from the diamond and onto the chessboard in front of so many viewers it's just exposing new audiences to the game and we just want to show our appreciation for all of the cleveland guardian players Totally. And the guys look like they're just genuinely having so much fun. I love to see the celebrations after. Uh, I know I wish I was that happy winning a pawn, Robert. Gone are the, <laughs> the days where I appreciate a pawn as much as Bo Naylor, you know? <laughs> it's true, right? Like the little things mean so much uh, when you're just getting started or you're playing friends and you're from a different background than chess. So it's true. Like you see someone blunder a back rank checkmate and instead of, uh, getting you know up in arms about it it's like 
yeah, here's what you miss. So next time I allow it, you can capitalize. Make sure you don't do it against me. Uh, do it against one of your future opponents. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And the guys, the spirits are high. The next round appears to be just getting underway now as well. This is a big matchup because, I mean, this is a chance for some people to potentially be handed their first loss. And it is a best of four games match. First of two and a half points wins and advances to the semifinals. And just a reminder that even the players who lose their matches, they still get three total on the day. So it's great to yeah. see that everyone gets to gain this experience. But Amon, that means uh, right now a draw is the end of the road for these players. Mm -hmm. Do they know that? That's my first question. Yeah, I, I feel like another thing that might just be part of this competition is that a draw simply might not exist. Like, we might not see a draw today. So even if these guys know it, I'm not sure if they know how to play for a draw. And to be honest, I prefer it that way, Robert. It means we're just going to see some fighting chess right to the end. You know what? These guys are all out here to win, that's for sure. You just told me they don't know how to play for a draw. And look at the position we have in front of us. Stephen Kwan <laughs> just quickly trades the queens off, being as professional <laughs> as humanly possible. And then uh, pl plunks his knight on d5, an active square. So this is a uh, maybe let's vacuum all the pieces off and call it a day and a match. Yep. Very, yeah, very professional approach. I stand corrected here. And Tristan <laughs> McKenzie is, is up against it here because he needs to win and he doesn't have his most powerful piece. One thing that I notice a lot, Robert, is queens on the board is uh, usually what most people prefer because that's the strongest piece. It's the easiest one to use. And if you can hear that, it's because we are bringing in Gab, who's on site with the Cleveland Guardians players. Gab, uh, you know, great to have you join the show. Can you tell us uh, what it's like on the ground there in Goodyear, Arizona? Thank you so much. And thank you for joining me in the first slug test tournament here. And it's a great environment. These are a lot of great personalities on the team. As you can see, Austin Hedges just having himself some more lights, doing a little trash talking yeah. here. Not uncommon to see that from this personality. We're actually really excited to have him back. We didn't have him last year. He uh, won a World Series for the Texas Rangers, leading the Diamondbacks. But it was great to have him back because he's such a great leader and such a it looks like the vibes are high down. Um, Stephen Kwan getting all the guys into chess. It sounds like that's what he said. He used to play with his dad, get me by his arms. He hated that, so he had to keep practicing and become a master himself. But he's very humble. He'll be the first to tell you. Uh, he's been beaten plenty of times by some of the players from one of our local schools, the John Marshall Chess team. We've done as an organization, the Guardians, have partnered with them, uh, with the students of the They're national championship team guys, so they're, they're not best around. Steven will be the first to tell you. He's been beat more than once by a couple of the high school players, but it's really been a great initiative to get some students who are more interested in chess and video games. And, and interested in sports, interested in baseball, and that it's also been a great way for the players to play the community and become uh, competitors with each other, build that morale and camaraderie with each other over this game. And it's it's fun to see. It looks like everyone's really locked in. I will say some of the players, like Will Brennan, surprised me yesterday. He said his nerves for this church tournament are way higher than for any baseball game. I think they're playing for not only charity, but their pride here, their bragging rights, and all of that. So, really great to see here. I know we just got set up with the technology, so I think I understand how this works now. Keep doing your thing, fellas, and check in with me whenever. All right, Gab. We'll uh, check in with you in a bit. Thanks so much for the insights on the ground. Uh, please keep us updated, including uh, the drink choices of the players. Amon, that's really funny to hear that uh, he just – Grab a couple of beers and during his match. Uh, you don't typically see that in chess tournaments. Uh, I love it. I love it. That is exactly the type of check-in on the ground reporting that I need. In fact, I need more of that at chess tournaments, Robert. We, uh, I think we need Gab showing up at some of the national championships in the U.S. and telling me that, you know, uh, oh, looks like a tough position there for Hikaru. And, you know, the Miller lights are being cracked open. I want to hear more of that. 
That was great. Well, Austin Hedges did just win his match three games to none, so he sails through to the semifinals. I also feel like he'd be a gr- good addition to the chess bras, right? Totally. Totally. I love the, love the energy. Um, very animated on cam. Um, you know, I was speaking of Hikaru. He's the most animated chess player that I can think of. And I've always thought that that's great for, for chess. So nice to see the personalities showing in this event here as well. So the guys are having a ton of fun. And Stephen Kwan was having all the fun in this match, but I haven't really looked. And suddenly it's Tristan McKenzie with a huge advantage in this game. And actually a free bishop at the moment after Stephen Kwan's last move. That's right. And Tristan McKenzie, it's so funny that this was the one game we mentioned earlier, like, oh, Stephen Kwan's playing for a draw, trading the Queens. But actually, Tristan took that as a challenge. And I think this has been his best game yet. So he's currently crushing one of the favorites uh, in the entire event. Let's see if he can keep it together here. Great moves, though, Robert. I feel like Tristan, you know, he has the misfortune, let's call it, of playing the highest rated player. So he didn't look quite as good as he actually is. But at the moment, he is completely outplaying uh, Stephen Kwan. And so look at this move. That is a fantastic move. Defending his knight. His knight and bishop were in a line with one another. And that frees his rook to do other tasks while hitting that A4 pawn. So, I mean, Amon, this is very strong play from Tristan McKenzie. Yeah, and, you know, just being the... uh devil's advocate here robert i just hope that we don't see some misfortune happening with that black king maybe like rook takes pawn and in in the wrong moment maybe a checkmate there so that's something for him to watch out for and look at that move right there oh double attack and i think for tristan i'm looking at the clock that is not going to play any favors for him because he is getting quite low multiple pieces are under attack uh, he needs to find tactics in, in this position. Not easy mm-hmm. to spot, though. If rook takes knight. Uh, that is really a difficult choice for him. Yeah, rook takes knight, rook to e2, rook to b2. I think all these moves are playable, even rook to c2. But all of them look like they lose material. So very, very difficult. And that's why he's spending so much time here. But there's no increment, no bonus time after each I move know. is made. And now he's down to 40 seconds. Will he have enough time, even if he continues to have a winning position? I feel like if I was in the, the clubhouse, you know, I was, uh, you know, a coach in his corner, I'd be just screaming, move, move, any move. Well, he, he made a move and he pushed his B pawn. That gives Stephen Kwan an outside pass pawn. I'm sure he's thrilled about that. I feel like the odds are in Stephen's favor at this point, just because of the clock situation more than anything. Yep. Yep. Totally agree. Decides to take the knight on e3. Bishop moves back. Now there is, you know, some kind of hope for a checkmate. But as I say that, Stephen Kwan makes some space for his king. Not the first time today we've seen him do that. He frees up his knight. No more back rank checkmate. Black does have this pass pawn. So if you save your rook right now, then push your pawn. You have chances. But the clock, I'm on. He's down to yep. 16 seconds. Yeah, 16 seconds is just not going to be enough time. There's some outside checkmate ideas on F1. Uh, honestly, he's playing so well, Tristan McKenzie, but I think the clock is going to be his worst enemy here. It is, and I just can't see him uh, being able to convert this with no time, but he is pushing that B pawn. It's doing rumbling the right things. down the board. He's doing everything he can. He just doesn't have enough time. Yep, and Steven definitely knows where his pieces need to be to uh, counteract that. Now he's picked up the bishop, and the six seconds, seven seconds should not be enough, but what a trick! That was awesome! You know, he just gave up his rook to promote the pawn. That was cheeky. Oh, man, that was like, that was the best way to go out, honestly. Like, what what an idea, rook b5, and baiting knight captures b5, and he was actually winning in the final position. (laughs) And that was a good attempt. You see the handshake there. And Tristan McKenzie's like, <laughs> you're going to get this one, but yeah. I'm a pitcher. You're a batter. You better watch your back in uh, some of our practices. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Wow. And as you kind of mentioned it, that you know, going up against Stephen Kwan in the first round is kind of unfortunate in terms of a pairing. Uh, but I, I think he, from what I saw there, uh, Robert, he had a great showing, and I definitely expect him to get some wins in the, in the rest of his matches. 
And we know we'll have at least one match with the fourth game. T Tanner Bybee wins with the black pieces against Daniel Schneeman. So that will go to the fourth game of the match. And it looks like Bo Naylor gets the job done. We see the handshake from these two players. Bo moves on. So we know three of our four semifinalists. Yeah, we're definitely some lopsided results, but we don't have all of them determined just yet. I'm curious to see if we're going to see any, you know, huge comebacks because it uh, takes a certain kind of player to lose a couple early games and then come all the way back for the reverse sweep. <laughs> the reverse sweep. Now that would be something we see. Three matches are in the books. Stephen Kwan, Austin Hedges, Bo Naylor, they all move on. Tristan McKenzie, David Fry, Will Brennan will continue in the competition. Everyone gets three matches. But Daniel Schneeman, 2-1 lead him on. Tanner Bybee still has a chance. That's right. Some uh, three O's there, as you mentioned. But Tanner Bybee is looking to make this uh, a comeback. And what I'm anticipating here, Robert, is that the tensions are going to be pretty high because he's going to be the only game going. So I wonder if all the guys in the clubhouse are going to be crowded around. And that could be a bad thing for one of those two players because it's a distraction. But we have our three of four semifinals. Stephen Kwan will take on Austin Hedges. We'll see how many beers Austin Hedges has down by then. It seems like he's having <laughs> a great time. He's a leader of the clubhouse, a World Series champion a year ago. And Stephen Kwan, a two-time Gold Glove winner. And there we see the players. There are some of their reactions having a great time in Goodyear, Arizona. Yeah, and I love how a lot of the reactions are them looking off cam because they're all beside each other and they're probably reacting to someone winning a piece on another board. Yeah, oh, it's like, you know, what are you doing? I'm looking at you. Uh, we <laughs> see some of these fun reactions, but uh, also good sportsmanship all around. So, Amon, we only have one game here in the quarterfinals still to go. Can Tanner Bybee, we haven't checked in on his match all that much, but can he get it done and make this a 2-2 tie? Yeah, if I'm, uh, I am I feel like I'm thinking back and I'm, I'm wondering, was one of those with a missed checkmate or was that a different match? I think it might have been a different match. So this one was 2-0 for uh, Schneeman and then Bybee with the win, the clutch win. I would say that with the momentum in his favor and them being the only game now, if everyone's kind of crowding around and making this feel like a much more tense situation, I think that kind of favors the guy trying to make a comeback here. And we heard from Gab that some of these players have been super nervous about competing in this chess event. We don't want anyone to be nervous. It's fun. We love yeah. that uh, players from different sports and backgrounds are playing chess, but we can also understand why they're nervous. I mean, they're playing a game that maybe they have not been playing since childhood in front of a huge crowd. So it's unlike playing baseball where, yeah, there are jeers and boos and people shouting obscenities at them, but they know they're great at that game because they're professionals. That's right. Yeah, no, it's uh, definitely exciting to watch uh, players that are elite at baseball competing in chess. And guess what? They're natural athletes. They're natural competitors, Robert. So no matter what you say, they can't really take a loss, uh, you know, lightly. They're all here to win at the end of the day. For sure. And Tanner Bybee, such an impressive young player in the MLB, was second in Rookie of the Year voting. I think his ERA was under three, which is absolutely nuts. I mean, he is such a star, a rising star. But now he needs to prove it over the chessboard. So far, mm -hmm. Amon, I like what I'm seeing from these two. Solid play. Yeah, I mean, the piece is pretty much all developing exactly where you want them. A really good tip is usually to develop one bishop and then move one of your center pawns, and then move the other bishop. That's how you develop both bishops to their best possible diagonals. And you see here the difference in Black's position. For Schneeman, he's got that bishop blocked in with one of his center pawns. But look at this. Normally we tell beginners not to push <laughs> pawns where their king is likely to go, but Bybee needs to win this game. And I That's love right. this. I love, I love the outline of his position. That bishop on g6. It is not a very active piece. And White's pawns, they uh, form a brick wall, stopping that bishop from seeing the light of day. Yeah, absolutely. That bishop is almost trapped, if not for the, the last move, giving it that square, which is not that pretty. We see knight to b5. So what I'm getting from uh, Tanner Bybee here, Robert, is aggression. That's the name of the game. He's putting everything forward. And 
honestly, that's probably the type of strategy that he needs with, uh, you know, he's got to win. And the clock will be a factor. There is no increment. So if you get down to the wire, you're going to have to show off those mouse skills. So just trying to cause some confusion can pay off. But that does drop a pawn. I, I see your arrows. You, of course, are showing Tanner's intentions here. He wants to be super active. And he's laughing. He's distracted. I mean, people are talking to him. But that pawn was hanging. It could have been captured. That's right. The g4 pawn will still be hanging if the bishop moves, but that's actually a really good response because now the knight on c6 is hanging. Let's see if Schneeman takes this bishop in the middle of the board. I, I expect him to. And that bishop should be captured. It's posing a big threat into black's position, and it was captured. Was that a pre move, Amon? Did he pre move pawn takes bishop? Uh, pawn takes knight, excuse me? Just about. Yeah, it seemed like it might not have been a pre move, but that almost makes it more impressive. It was a hover. You know, he, he was ready and waiting for it. That's a professional move. <laughs> and this move, G5, and you see the fist pump from Bybee. I mean, he's vibing with the position. The evaluation bar to the left of the board doesn't like what White has done. He's committed too much. Uh, he has some loose oh. pawns. Oh, and now, of course, he doesn't like it. And look at Schneeman. He can't believe it. Oh, my goodness. And his head is in his hands there. Tanner Bybee knows that is a costly mistake. It's not only the fact that he lost a full rook, but that it's unstoppable, the loss of the queen as well. Oof. Yeah, that's brutal. And so oh. for Schneeman, he's just mopping up, and that's another great move to flick in with a pin. Let's see if he piles up pressure and just starts trading everything. Yeah. Queen d7 to f5. And look, you can't go wrong with trades. Very nice technique from Schneeman here, who pretty much just needs to not lose the queen and i think he's winning the game if he drops the queen then it's actually even material so he is up yeah. a full queen at the moment i like his last move he's trying to develop uh, just trying to get all of his pieces out and then knight can hop into the center and create more damage and you can see tanner bybee he is not happy with what has transpired he probably was feeling his chances with the active oh. play oh no man not and the, the disrespect rook. you know he's got time to you know Dap up his, his teammates in the bag. He's like, yeah, I got him. I got him. I got time to say what's up. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, you know, maybe, maybe go back to the mount. You know, keep on pitching uh, because this chess thing, that's my domain, says Daniel Schneeman. Exactly. I mean, oh, he's just pitching pieces at him right now. One, two, three. I mean, he's only got two pieces left at this point. Um, Bishop B2. I mean, try to win one of them. That's all I got to recommend here because... If he survives this, this would be the most insane comeback ever. No way. I mean, <laughs> crazy things have happened in our slug, blitz, you know, pog champs. But look at this. It's a queen and rook ahead for black. Very safe king. Plenty of time. This would be maybe the upset of all upsets if Daniel Schneeman somehow did not convert this. All right, hear me out here. King <laughs> goes up to A5, Robert. You know, <laughs> call me a dreamer, but... I, I think he can still pull it off. Of course, I'm referring to a, a hopeful stalemate, not a win. Yeah, some kind of stalemate. That would be a miracle. But checkmate in one is uh, threatened. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it did free up a square for yep. the white king. So checkmate in two moves now. We see that the evaluation bar tells us the game's ready. Okay, if he finds this checkmate, I will be yeah, I was really say, impressed. That's a tough one to spot. I would expect maybe this or even just taking some of these pawns is uh pretty pretty normal to do here to start mopping up material yeah there we go and look at him he's locked in he took a pawn he says all right this uh, b3 moves. pawn is next he's yeah. trying to this king is running that's right don't underestimate <laughs> now okay king d7 okay we're getting close here robert <laughs> <laughs> we are getting closer to a stalemate. I, it's so hard to imagine. Uh, and that actually takes away the fleeing square from the White King. So a checkmate in two, once again, is um, oh. right at, Oh! Oh, you I, see his face? <laughs> I think he might have thought his rook was there or maybe his knight protected. Just a huge error. And on the cam, he's like, I can't believe I just did that. And I mean, he doesn't know he's still completely winning by the evaluation yeah. bar. Of course, he's up material, but he is really annoyed by what happened. And you saw Tanner Bybee is like laughing at him. And that's only going to cause further frustration. And we'll see if he can now avoid further blunders. 
Yeah, okay, he's doing the right thing. Pretty smart choice here. Although he's up, he still didn't have a queen. And obviously a queen is the most powerful, easiest to checkmate with. So he says, okay, well, I got some pawns. Let's go make one. And we see our featured chat. I'm not a rapper, but Schneeman playing like a demon. Yeah, I think you should brush up on those skills, if I'm being honest, but we do appreciate the effort. And we love the effort given by both of these players. It's the fourth and final game. Oh, you're trying to get another stalemate word. You Damn know. it. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. There is hope here. If he moves his king, but I think, of course, and good move, he should move his bishop. But there are lots of hopes here. Knight b3 creates a stalemate position for the king. So, mm. hey, look, I, I'm just, I'm holding out over here, Robert. And there are people over both players' shoulders, and that's going to increase the nerves. But it looks like Daniel Schneeman, he's ahead on the clock, still plenty mm -hmm. of time, and he's doing the right thing by pushing his pawns. And he can keep pushing. Oh, yeah, this queen. is great. King c3. King c3. <laughs> oh, he, damn, he's got to go that way. You're trying to set up some kind of stalemate that, you know, you're trying to make fetch happen, Amon. I'm, I'm really working here, but unfortunately, he's made it way too easy, and that will be a victory in one more move. He probably didn't even realize there was a legal move there. There it is. <laughs> and Schneeman, he's still laughing at his blunder of a queen, but it ultimately didn't matter. Just like in the wins and losses column, people will forget how it happened. So there we see the handshakes, a win for Daniel Schneeman, and... Credit to Tanner Bybee. He was the yep. only lower-rated player in the quarterfinals, Amon, that scored a win. Yeah, that and that speaks uh, for his chess right there because even in this game, it felt like he had that initial aggression. He was creating his own plans. He just fell victim to one of the nastiest blunders available. Lost his rook and then his queen and ultimately lost his chances in that match. As we look at our semi-final pairings, Stephen Kwan versus Austin Hedges, Bo Naylor, he now knows his opponent. It's Daniel Schneeman. Amon, I feel like these four, they deserve to get to uh, the semi-finals. And then the other four contestants, they will also continue in the Constellation bracket. Yeah, as we keep mentioning, um, and I'll certainly remind people, we have a Constellation bracket because honestly, some of the most entertaining personalities are in the consolation bracket, Robert. So but we're not trying to get them off the show. In fact, those are probably going to be some really entertaining ones coming up. So definitely more chess to be played by all these athletes. For sure. Everybody gets three matches here in Slug Champs. It's the Cleveland Guardians playing live from Goodyear, Arizona. They're having a grand old time. Uh, you're talking some trash, drinking a little bit, and just enjoying each other's company and the competition over the chessboard. And I just want to note that, well, this is a one-day event. There are other chess competitions that you should keep an eye on because yeah. friendly rivalries or intercollegiate rivalries, those are a thing. Don't miss the Collegiate Chess League this weekend as reigning champion St. Louis University faces the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. Both teams top the leaderboard for now, but on Saturday, February 24th, only one can walk away with the win. As always, the CCL's own Joe Lee and Anna Kramling are calling the action. Use the command CCL in chat for everything you need to know. We are gonna take a short break, but when we return, it is Slug Champs, the Cleveland Guardians are swinging on the chessboard. Community Series continues on January 4th with Crazy House, where you can add your opponent's captured pieces to your own arsenal. Six weekly arena tournaments held every Thursday will be followed by a championship event with cash prizes, including a $1,000 first place prize. The third and final weekly arenas will be streamer arenas featuring gifted subs as prizes. Win any of these events to qualify for the championship and show the world what you've got. Join the Variance Club today to learn more about upcoming events, how to participate, and much, much more. See you in the arena on chess.com.
I'm here with Magnus Carlsen, world number one, and to many, greatest chess player of all time. We're gonna ask him a few questions. I'm gonna name a sport. You have to tell me the greatest of all time. Mm -hmm. Sounds good? Yeah. Basketball. LeBron James. Soccer. Messi. I agree with both. Baseball. Barry Bonds. <laughs> what did he say? <laughs> okay. <laughs> football like American football. Tom Brady, I guess. Okay, yeah, good one. Uh, tennis. Djokovic. Golf. Tiger. Fair. Poker. Doug Brunson. That's a unique one. Chess. Garry Kasparov. Are you allowed to say yourself? I don't know if I'm allowed, but I think Gary is the best of all time still. Chess boxing. <laughs> I'm on Hamilton. I agree. We're gonna play this or that. Would you rather go on a cruise or a road trip? Road trip. Comedy or thriller? Comedy. Coffee or tea? Tea, but only slightly. Preferably neither. How do you get energized? The sun. Cats or dogs? Cats. But I like dogs too. It's like a, this or that is a little bit tough with you. You like everything. Shower or bath? Oh, shower for sure. Okay. I don't have the patience to take bath. Are you a morning person or a night owl? Night owl for sure. Would you rather get on a phone call or text message? Text probably. I feel like the answer for you is neither. I feel like it's just- Usually, yes. <laughs> just, just go. Sunrise or sunset? Sunrise. Winter or summer? Summer. How many beers would it take for you to drink for me to beat you in a classical chess game? That's a very difficult question because uh, I'd probably sober up during the game, so I'd probably have to keep drinking. Probably start with 20 and take it from there. 20, okay. How, what's the size of the cup? Um, pints. Wow, okay, 20. Name your price if you have to chess box. Um, $10 million. Do you prefer to play chess on a computer, over the board, or on your phone? I rarely play on my phone. I, I would say I prefer to play on the computer. In your entire career, have you ever had a day where you went, I think this guy might be as good as me in chess? <laughs> no. Oh! Uh, well, I mean, not, 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 you know, since, not the last 10 years, for sure. Okay. Has it ever been, this guy might be kind of close to me if I have a bad day? Yeah, uh, I would say Fabio at his best was um, very close in, in classical for sure. My other question was going to be, who do you think is the second best chess player in the world? So, I suppose. Yeah, I think Fabiano Corona is the, is the second, second best player. Yeah. Thank you, Magnus, for sitting down with us and doing these rapid fire questions. Now get out of here. continues as the sun still high in the sky in Goodyear, Arizona as the Cleveland Guardians and they're getting set for the 2024 baseball season. They are in spring training where right now they are in the heat of a competition facing off in slug champs, the Guardians Chess Club. Uh, they are trying to see who will come out on top and claim bragging rights and uh, be able to donate to the charity of their choice. It's a big competition. They have friendly competitions in the clubhouse and the dugout and also 
with the local high school community. And on hand, we do have a very special Did any guest. Of the we have another Akshar Patel, like a graduate of course. Oh, yeah. uh, uh, Marshall High School. Akshar, um, it's so nice to have no, you on the show. No, because once they uh, did, I was already mad. Come on, I'm going to ask you the question. How about just this break from baseball? How's your team These baseball players. And how is it to connect with the guys over I mean, I'm doing good. Spring training has been really awesome seeing all the guys get us. It's always really good. I mean, chess could be for anyone. You don't need to be any sort of stature. Actually, so, yeah, I was also going to ask uh, whether you played mentally in person or if you played with any of these guys online. They're playing online right now, but I imagine you probably played face to face. How do you feel with pressure? Yeah, I did play. I mostly played online. I mean, I'm not but the other uh, the other players I play, I played them in person. <laughs> and and Akshar, I've seen your term history. It seems like you're a little bit stronger than them. So are you trash talking? Are you giving them odds? What's that dynamic like when you play against these baseball players? I try not to trash talk. Just <laughs> if if they start, then I'll have to continue with it. But I I keep myself down. I I humble myself. Okay, yeah, you stay you stay respectful first, but you know, if they're gonna go down that road, you're not gonna back down either. I get it. I get it. <laughs> so like what what's the uh record? Are you gonna drop any of the uh the scores for us here? Are you uh are you crushing all these guys? The record. I uh I only know against Steven Kwan because it was on my uh, chess.com app on the recommended match. It's like eighteen and I think one draw, eighteen wins and one draw. Oof. Ooh. Yeah, so. <laughs> okay, I see that. You got the numbers. It's something like that. You have them uh, all in your back pocket. But uh, actually, you're now at the University of Akron. You played for John Marshall High School. Right. Uh, what's the chess scene like in Akron and just in uh, Ohio more generally? How are you enjoying that? Uh, it's pretty nice to have a lot of local tournaments going on here. Like you could find a tournament almost in any of the cities in the northeast part of the Ohio. And then, uh, yeah, uh, for my uh, university's team, uh, we are planning on competing in a, in a University of uh, Toledo. They have, they're having a tournament next month. So, yeah, we're not that active right now because we're all busy with college and stuff. But, like, yeah, we try our best to participate as much as we can. Yeah, well, I mean, Akshar, uh, you know, it's been awesome having you on. We want to check in with you later as well, hopefully. Uh, but seriously, it's awesome to you know hear about your uh, chess playing with these players and so good that you're keeping it up even uh, with your college studies. So appreciate you joining the show, friend. All right, thank you. And that is Akshar Patel, who is a graduate of the John Marshall High School, plays with uh, these Cleveland Guardians. And um, I love that he had the specific record in mind it was like i think it's something like this no it definitely is that yeah exactly I, look i'll take the heat for that i i coaxed it out of him because i knew he had the receipts on file you don't you don't go toe to toe with these uh with these athletes and not know what your record is he's never lost let's just put it that way so uh, the the record speaks for itself robert <laughs> it certainly does. And well, while we were talking and catching up with Akshar, it, Gab was catching up with Tanner Bybee. Let's hear what he had to say. Hey guys, it's Gab and I'm here with Tanner Bybee. If you didn't know too much about him, we're going to congratulate him on the spot for Blue Rollins. He's been very impressive. I've been honored this past year with Tanner Bybee. He's been Uh, I mean, it was going well after that third game. Um, got to off to a good start in the fourth game, and I just absolutely watched it. We on, we went, took the look, and from there it was just it was all over. Well, he has a little bit more experience than the chess. How long have you been? I mean, just since last year, since Juan kind of introduced me to it, I started playing this good Juan. It's like, I think it's super late, but I'm not. I think he told me yesterday he's got maybe four or five years of experience. Okay, yeah, I did So he's, he's been dabbling. How did the time? play a role for you and how did that influence your strategy? Uh, totally too bad. Um, I think 
my goal on each of these videos. So my goal this was to try them out, but we're so <laughs> so <laughs> Were there any subtle things he did in your head? No, she was very true to the heart. Okay. Very, very true. Just kept himself yeah. together, yeah. just a silent. Not, no, yeah, he's just like, oh, I'm kind of guy. Did any of the racket from the other players, like the animated heads, of course, oh, yeah. uh, ruin your focus? Um, no, because once they did, I was already down the floor, so, but it, it's a good time. How about just this break from baseball? How's your spring training been going, and, and how is it up here to connect with the guys over uh, the Universal Game of Thrones? Yeah, I mean, spring training's been really awesome, seeing all the guys again, um, and just being able to bond something else, you know, like foreign competition that's very different from baseball. It's always really good. I mean, like, chess could be for anyone. You don't need to be uh, any sort of stature or anything like that. So, yeah. I think it's called chess challenges if you mentally and how to deal with pressure. You might have a little pressure coming into this year, especially having such a standout start for your rookie season. How do you deal with the pressure and being able to come out this year and duplicate and go further than you have? Um, I just think I have to, uh, have to like reinvent the wheel at all. I think um, I think just trying to stay true to myself, trying to stay true to what I do off the field, and take over. Well, thanks so much for your time, yeah, and uh, good luck playing in the loser's bracket. Thank you. 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 And we see our semi-finalists in the champions bracket as well as the consolation. Those who lost their first matches, they continue. But Amon, all eyes are going to be on Stephen Kwan versus Austin Hedges and Bo Naylor versus Daniel Schneeman. Yeah, those are the, uh, the matchups between the players that have won in the first round. Of course, Daniel Schneeman, the only one to have lost so far. But now the ratings start to get a little tighter. And surely, I think these are not going to be clean sweeps the way that we saw in the first round. No, not at all. I don't think that will be the case here. And we did hear from Tanner Bybee, uh, who was talking about baseball with Gab, talking about what you know he's looking forward to this coming season. And he's not going to be reinventing the wheel when it comes to prep. He is just going to continue with what has been working. It didn't quite work out on the chessboard for Tanner Bybee, but he did get one win, so he should be proud as he heads into the consolation bracket. But Amon, as you look at our top boards up here, it's Hedges against Quan, it's Schneeman against Naylor. Who you got? Well, I I, I think Hedges is the uh, is the pick for me, so I'll go with Hedges and uh, Naylor in these matches. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're going for the upset alert. You just like uh, what he was doing in between games even more than what Hedges was doing on the board. I, I respect that, Amon. I like uh, the way you think. I'm going to go with Quan and Naylor. Those are my two picks to move on to the finals. Well, let's see. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I definitely think that uh, in these matches we'll start to see a little bit less of like maybe a, a huge blunder, but... Also, the nerves of uh, now being in the next round are going to play into it as well. And will anyone take out Stephen Kwan? Is he going to lose a game of chess today? <laughs> That's the big question. He was in trouble against uh, Tristan McKenzie, but Tristan couldn't get the job done. And well, Bo Naylor, we see he's in the right hand side of our screen. Uh, you know, he's uh, had. He's a great player, a great ball player. He's also impressed on the chessboard. And it seems like he's very humble. I've read some of his interviews and some articles. Some of my friends who are really into baseball were just so excited for this event, telling me about uh, these players. And Bo Naylor, uh, Tanner Bybee actually gives him a lot of credit for being a large reason for his success. So it's great to mm -hmm. hear how the teammates compliment one another. Uh, and, well, we're off. We are. And uh, in the top left of your screen there, Immediately, we see a pretty reliable opening for Stephen Kwan as he's just putting both center pawns forward. It's really worked well for him. Um, the scotch, most of the time, it's called. But uh, what do you make of this reaction here from Hedges? Because I love it. Knight f6, and Knight immediately captures in the center. And the top left game, yeah, Hedges, he grabs a pawn after giving up a pawn. Uh, that knight may have get stranded. It's quite advanced and uh, doesn't have too many pieces to help defend it. But Stephen Kwan was burning precious time. It's early goings. But I'm on that no increment. I think as these matches get closer, the players yeah. are more even by rating. It's going to play a bigger role in the outcome of the games. Totally right. I'm, you know, uh, obviously I wouldn't wish this on anyone, but... 
I really am excited to see these guys handle a time scramble because that's just pure entertainment. Yes, and there was a, uh, a great position for White, and that move Rook to E1 sliding into the center. Watch out. It's entertaining for us and for viewers when a queen is lost to a Rook, and that actually just drops a knight and a bishop and the <laughs> queen. So unfortunately for Hedges, he sort of bit off more than he could shoot taking that center pawn. Yeah, uh, about to get a position where what might happen is, yeah, and he's going to lose this piece as well. The only piece that he'll have developed here is his queen. Not usually a good sign. No, especially when you're dropping a second minor piece. And Stephen Kwan double-checking, looking at the board. And again, he's putting his hand over his camera. So maybe he is using a tablet rather than a laptop because his hand keeps getting in the frame. But he's up two minor pieces at this stage. Amon is completely cruising. Yeah, he, he really is. Even though the, the players are actually very similarly rated, uh, the white pieces, what I've seen from Stephen Kwan with white is, you know, he gets the two pawns in the center very quickly and almost always works out for him. So, uh, oh, that's not going to help either. The white pieces are very strong for Stephen Kwan. It seems like he's a very fundamentally sound chess player. I'm not talking about baseball. We know he's a two-time gold glove winning player. He was uh, very close to winning rookie of the year a couple seasons ago, but he really does seem like he has his fundamentals down him on. He plays uh, this scotch game from the white side. He understands when to castle, get his king save, and as you're pointing out, now it's tactics time, and he Ouch. eats pawns and then rooks for breakfast. That's He's cooking them. And he's actually, after bishop e7, He's going to walk himself right into checkmate without even trying here. And you don't have to look for anything. Don't get fancy. Take the rook, and that's checkmate in game one. And look <laughs> at him. He promote who, Whose bingo card was that on Amon? Promoting with checkmate while capturing. Yeah. Promoting, capturing with checkmate on move 13, by the way. <laughs> that's almost like a, it's like a puzzle. Yeah, look at him. He's pumped up. And, uh, well, we, we see uh, smiles from some of our other contestants. as They're getting distracted, enjoying uh, their teammates' successes and failures. But our first game done involved our highest-rated player. Stephen Kwan gets it done with White. And, whoa, Bo Naylor says, hey, I can do that too. Yeah, I immediately looked at that game. And Bo Naylor off to a great start here. He's got the queen in the center of the board. Queen for bishop, so... He's, he's doing well. Bo Naylor looking like a serious contender for the Slug Champs title. And I'm looking at our bottom row of games. For some reason, Will Brennan just refuses to be on camera. Maybe it's uh, the outfielder's choice. But T Tanner Bybee, uh, we heard that interview with Gab. He seems uh, very motivated and excited for the upcoming baseball season. He should be motivated here in the chess event because I think he has a good chance of coming out on top in the consolation bracket. But as you pull up our other a champions bracket matchup. Amon, this is one-sided. It's an extra queen for just the bishop for Bo Naylor. Yeah, you know, what's interesting is even though the level between the players objectively has gotten closer, I do feel like these are some of the most one-sided games I've seen. And I, I wonder if that's going to continue here because uh, then we immediately know who kind of the strongest uh, players are in this event. Uh, Bo Naylor's got the hood up. You know, it looks like he's about to, instead of having a walk-up song, he's like about to walk in the ring and knock his opponent out. And that's exactly what he's doing, at least on the chessboard. Uh, he's up a queen for just a bishop. Yep. Black can't move. And uh, I think an instructive note for some of our uh, more inexperienced and newer audience members is keep your king and your just in, your piece in general on the opposite color of your opponent's bishop. Don't walk onto light squares where you may uh, be hit by a surprise check or lose some of your pieces. Look at all of the white piece on dark squares, avoiding that bishop's gaze. Yep, that's a great point. And whether he's done that intentionally or not, it doesn't matter. It's, it's there in the position. And that's why I think he's kind of cruising to victory right now. He's pushing his two pawns as well. What a great thing to do if you don't know what to do. Yeah, push a pawn and make another queen trading off the rooks that was Black's last heavy piece, something that could do some potential damage. Now it's queen against bishop, so as long as he doesn't put his queen on a light square where the bishop takes mm -hmm. it, he should be able to win this game. But I'm looking at the yeah. clock. Still safe for Bo Naylor. He's way ahead on time and in position. Yeah, it's, it's almost like a puzzle to find the mistakes that could happen. Queen on d5, queen on c6. 
they are light squares, but I think he's going to just start vacuuming up these pawns, so he should be relatively safe here. And that bishop, that poor bishop, offside, can't get back in the game, can't really help or create any semblance of threats. So, yeah, you throw a pawn forward, it can be captured in three different ways. The bishop hey, survives. There you You're go. just down, to, to, down too many pieces. Yeah, it's it's like uh, saving Private Ryan. You know, we extracted the bishop, so we can call that a win. <laughs> I was not expecting a saving Private Ryan reference, but that's a good one. That's true. Uh, you know, save it at all costs, and all Black has is that bishop and a pawn, and White has this queen. Though, what's this G four pawn falls him on? Okay, he didn't take it. I was gonna say maybe Black can throw that H pawn forward, but I mm -hmm. think what Bo needs to do now is uh, try to push his C pawns. Those are passers. Uh, get your queen to protect them, and then just push them up the board because that's, it doesn't require much in the way of calculation. Although this is a great move. Yeah, and somehow, some way, uh, I actually feel like Bo Naylor does understand about the dark squares because pretty much every single queen move has been on dark squares. So either he has just elite understanding or amazing luck. <laughs> and I feel like it's the <laughs> former. Yeah, and he's in everything right in here. He pushes his C-pawn. It can be captured. It's not really uh, a relevant piece in the position. But I also like to look at how these athletes react when a piece is captured and they weren't expecting it. Because sometimes they're just like enraged that they could possibly lose a piece. Other times, yeah. like, all right, take that. I gained something in return. And look what he gained. Access to G6 and checkmating nets around the Black King. Mm hmm Yep. He's going to take this one back and... The only, I guess, danger is maybe playing a move like this and kind of forgetting about the bishop moving backwards, but he's been operating on dark squares the whole time here, and let's see if he finds this one. Yes, he does. Confidence. You can yeah, see it totally. from Bonell. No celebration after the win. I mean, I think that's the sign of a player who is ready to win slug champs. Mm-hmm. Yep. That was one of the only times that he went on a light square the entire end game, and it was the right decision to do so. Delivering a checkmate. We did see in the bottom right, Tanner Bybee wins with the black pieces. All smiles on his camera, but we have one game left here. It's Tristan McKenzie with the black pieces, and oh, that white oh. king. It's checkmate in two coming up. Yep, and that, I don't think he's going to be able to stop that because how do you not save your queen here? Of course, you got to move it, but then one and two. Let's see if he knows this checkmating pattern. And it's unstoppable for David Fry. He has to slide his king over to its only safe square. And will we see checkmate? That's the big question. I think he's I talking think that... to him right now. He's telling him, <laughs> like, I got you. I know what you're going to do, and I know what I'm going to do. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. He's, like, looking around, not paying attention to the board anymore. He's like, you have one choice. And did he pre-move that? Yeah, because he sat back, actually, hands off the mouse. <laughs> so he was, at that point, he was showboating. I think that, uh, you know, you get hedges as you're a chess bra. I'm going with Tristan McKenzie, you know, pre-moving a checkmate while telling his opponent that's his only choice. I love it. That is awesome to see. And he's off to a great start in the Constellation bracket. Yeah, these, all these matches are, are pretty entertaining. But, you know, I kind of am excited for these Constellation uh, bracket matchups because the guys just have a little bit less to play for, so they're having a lot more fun with it. <laughs> they are indeed, and Tristan McKenzie and Tanner Bobby win with the black pieces in the Constellation semifinals. But a lot of our attention was up at the top as Stephen Kwan wins with white over Austin Hedges. Bo Naylor does the same against Daniel Schneeman. Those were some great games from the players with the white pieces of the champions semifinals. Amon, we saw them play, we saw their reactions. They're having a grand old time. They really are, yeah. Steven Kwan is looking, uh, you know, nearly unassailable there. But you know, as I say that, I'm reminded of that first round where he nearly lost. So, gotta take every game uh, in stride. And look at those two; they were playing <laughs> side by side for that one. <laughs> you know, it's funny to see that this is your opponent, but it's like almost like he's cheering him on. Look at how much laughter there is. They clearly love the game of chess. And while it's a competition, we'll put that in quotes because they are having a great time. Even if they may want to win, they want to represent uh, their uh, causes and their communities. They also just love the game and it seems like they love each other. It truly is a family in the Cleveland Guardians dugout. Yeah, Robert, it's uh, kind of making me think, man, when was the last time I was smiling that much playing a game of chess? I, I've got to rethink things over here.
<laughs> yeah, what have I done wrong with my life? Let's not let's not get into that right now, Oman. No, they're but they're they're having such a good time. It's actually just making me smile just seeing them have having fun with Chaz, but still, of course, competing. So I think so far the event is delivering on its promise. And so much respect for these athletes who play baseball at the highest level. They play for the Cleveland Guardians. Some of them, uh, you know, been on the team for a while. Others, you know, recently back on the Cleveland Guardians. And so, you know, leaving to win a World Series, I feel like that's a pretty good way to come back to Cleveland. So I have been compiling, you know, my elite uh, stats in my head, and I've got one for you, Robert. Uh, there have been no draws. Wow. <laughs> I'm actually surprised by that because sometimes we see a stalemate draw when someone's completely winning, but zero draws to this point uh, shows that they're fighting and that we have had some potentially lopsided matchups. I think now that the matchups are a little bit more even in rating, the draws number, it could change. Or, Amano, are you going to go so far to say we'll have zero this whole event? <laughs> I'm just going to I'm just gonna call it early. No draws this whole event. This is the slug chance. These guys are going for, you know, grand slams or, or nothing. You know, I'd rather strike out trying to hit a homer. Okay, I respect it. And the player who did leave the Guardians and then came back is Austin Hedges. He won a World Series last year, and now he's back in the clubhouse. And he's got the white pieces in this game. Amon, he's breaking one of our vital rules. You need to get your king to safety. You have to castle. That white king is sitting in the center, and well, he's moved pieces multiple times. That's not yeah. going to help, and there's going to be some problems for the White King. Yeah, on a on a really basic level, if you look at Stephen Kwan's pieces, he's castled, one move with his king, one move with his rook, one move with his bishop each knight, center pawns. That's just kind of the fundamental way that you approach chess. And you look at Austin Hedges, he's moved his queen, you know, probably one, two, three, four different times. The knight moved a couple times. So you usually want to spread out your moves to activate your entire army rather than just move one or two pieces over and over. And I agree with the feature chat comment that Austin Hedges is a gem. And I saw you, and I was about to say that, Amon, we're on the same page, telepathy there, that if that Black Knight jumps in the center, yes, it attacks the Queen. That's the good news. The bad news is it walks into checkmate in one. Do not move that Knight if you're Stephen Kwan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it's really tempting to activate your knight, hit the enemy queen, and in fact, on the previous turn, it would even threaten a pawn as well. So, if he, ref you know, I, I guess if he did not give in to temptation there, I, I don't think he'll do it now. No, instead he should push his central pawn and go after that white king. It's sitting in the center. His move is also a strong one. He's threatening, as you pointed out. Oh. He can do it now, but will he be able to give up his rook? That's the one of the tougher things uh, to do for uh, players at this level is give up what seems like an important piece. And he found it, Amon. I mean, he's on fire. Yep, he really is. And, you know, just doing the math on that equation there, it works out. You see that rook, five points. It's like, nope, let me go after that queen, which is far more valuable first. And then we can take back this bishop with a backwards knight. He does it all. He finds every good response. And now he's up a queen and one pawn, for good measure, to a rook. So it's a lot of extra material for Stephen Kwan. You see that uh, underneath the board here, the scorecard, playing with nearly 80% accuracy a month. That's a very high level for a blitz game, especially when you are a full-time professional athlete who's not spending all your time playing chess. Yeah, uh, that's impressive no matter what your rating is. Um... Probably the only negative thing that I could even attempt to mention about Stephen Kwan's position is maybe his time, but he's looking to make up for that and just go straight for the checkmate here. Oh, goodness. Uh, he was going for checkmate. Hedges, to his credit, he stopped that. And that's the good news, but he should go for it again. I like the arrow that you're pointing out. I think he, he's going to go for something just like that because he's got checkmate on the brain and the White King is lacking defenders. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that would be a really good idea. Sometimes in these spots where you're going for mate, you end up spending way too much time looking for it. And if you don't find it, you just wasted a lot of time on trying to make something work. So I'm looking at his time, 2 minutes, 15 seconds. He's still all good, but that's the thing to watch uh, for Austin Hedges as his attempt to come back here. And 
Quan centralizes his queen, a push. I mean, all of these moves are with purpose. From what I've yep. seen thus far from Stephen Quan, there was that one game against Tristan McKenzie. He was in some danger, but everything else has been nearly perfect. And yeah, Quan has been ruthless. His accuracy is continuing to increase, Amon. He's at 81.3% and just playing excellent move after excellent move. Yeah, this is fantastic chess by him right now. And honestly, in his game, um, I believe it was against Tristan McKenzie. That was more Tristan than it was a terrible game from uh, Stephen Kwan. So uh, I still feel like even in that one, he, he kind of played well. It's just Tristan played better. I'm with you. And he drops his queen back, so he makes sure he doesn't blunder it. Some players would have taken the bishop that was under attack, but no, the queen is more valuable. And now he should go in for the kill, go after the white king, and there it is, step one of month. This is just more great play from Kwan. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sh a special shout out to Austin Hedges when his bishop was attacked, coming up with knight f3, uh, like counterattack on the queen and the pawn. That was pretty impressive. And now he's going to have to do maybe, I think everyone's least favorite thing to do, play defense. You know, like it's like all fun and games when you're attacking in chess, but good defense is uh, just like they say in sports, it's going to win you uh, the game. And for Stephen Kwan, it's one of two gold gloves, and Austin Hedges has made a career on his defensive prowess as a catcher, throwing out uh, players trying to steal bases. And wow. he did just stop the checkmate in one threat. That was the only move available to him, and he saw it. So Hedges, he, he continues to dig deep, and he's fighting tough. This is what I was saying about the time, a minute and 20 seconds, and just the facial expressions of Stephen Kwan. He's, he's playing as if he's looking for a mate and if it's not going to present itself i do get concerned for his his time in the long run and how about his back rank he has not pushed any pawns earlier today amon we did see him very wisely push a pawn to give his king what we call luft some space some room to escape to and now queen takes f3 uh, that's <laughs> heading in for the checkmate the white king losing all of its protectors Quan finds it he does only have one minute five seconds amon so if the yeah. checkmate it happens in the next few moves, he can breathe. But if it doesn't, watch out for the back rank. That's the one thing he needs to keep an eye on. I feel like if he finds knight f4, I mean, I don't think rook takes bishop is going to happen, but I have to point out that it's the one kind of uh, opportunity that Austin might have to win the game outright. But, uh, I mean, Robert, everything we've seen from Steven has screamed fundamentally solid. So after knight f4, you feel like he's not going to let that happen. No, not going to allow a back rank checkmate, but he could blunder that bishop that's loose on h3. So, yeah, they're still tagging. Austin Hedges, I, I understand why he's your guy, Amon. Mm -hmm. He is not giving up without a true fight. This is great. Yeah, really impressed by uh, the defense because it's, like I said, it's one thing to attack. We all know it's fun to coordinate the pieces that way, but really impressed right now with the defensive moves. And that's a check. The king has only one legal square. So if you're Austin Hedges, you want to get that in quickly and put yeah. pressure on Stephen Kwan's clock. He's out under 45 seconds, Amon, and I don't see that quick of a checkmate that he can deliver. That's right. Um, you know, speaking a little advanced here, maybe he can take because he has the backwards knight move, but I don't think he's going to spot that queen covering a checkmate. So will we see our first draw here? No way. Whoa, he pushes his pawn, but he does drop both his bishop on h3 and that knight on f6. There could be back rank checkmate ideas still wow. hanging in the air. So Amon, he needs to be super careful. And look at Quan down under 40 seconds. Oh, Ooh. that's not going to help because the bishop can take the rook now. It's a shame because taking either one of these pieces would have still been a really good move. And Stephen Quan, 32 seconds though. Hmm. But under a minute is Austin Hedges, and he's slowing down. Uh, you know, he's deliberating. Should he block with his rook? But that drops his other rook on C1. That wouldn't be a good yep. idea. He could slide his king to the corner. But I think newer players, they don't like putting their king in the corner. They're always worried about getting checkmated. But he needs to play quickly. That's the only chance he has now. Mm -hmm. Pawn takes knight is going to be really tough to meet. He decides to take here instead. So maybe there's an opportunity to take, to take this bishop he still has chances here. 20 seconds. And I like that last move, keeping more peace on the board. I think that causes some confusion for Stephen Kwan. He drops his queen back. Take that bishop. And then we have a true game because 16 seconds oh. remain for black. 
Man, this knight is keeping him in the game, but he could be eliminating that bishop and almost surely winning. Instead, I think it's finally going to go down. Oh, it takes the rook, and I don't know if Steven has enough time. I, we'll yep. have to see how strong his bullet skills are, because 10.9 seconds is not a lot of time. No. This is really scary. He's threatening a mate. He needs to stop it. If he does, he has chances. Great move from Quan, by the way. Threatening mate in one. Uh, rook f2, the only choice. And now it's going to be oh. Hedges. Oh, he walks right into mate. And look at Quan, by the way. He is truly relieved. Yeah. No, he was stressing out, as, as we saw on cam there. But it was the resourcefulness of Quan at the end to actually set up a mate and not panic and say, okay, I'm going to set this up. See if you defend it. And he just kept testing Austin the entire game, ultimately paid off. Okay, so Stephen Kwan up two to none in his matchup against Austin Hedges. Uh, we did see Daniel Schneeman tie up the match against Bo Niller, So that one is as close as we've seen thus far. But we do have mm -hmm. one game remaining in yep. this uh, round at the moment. You have, uh, ooh, what is this? The Black King is in a world of hurt. It's Tristan McKenzie. But he only has 15 seconds, so this could go either way. Yeah, it's actually tough to find the safe place for the king, though. Like, it's <laughs> tough to even know where is legal to move. He, he did find it at long last, and there is checkmate in one move. Queen takes pawn, is game over. He doesn't oh, find like it. this move, though. A4, he understands he just needs to move anything. Look at that. Great stuff. Oh, David Fry is quick, but he's now getting himself a time trouble. Oh, my gosh, this is a scramble. Amon, who's going to get it? Oh. <laughs> I love the mic'd up moment there. <laughs> I love it. You know, all of his pieces are gone. He's like, I deserve that win. That was my, what happened? You know, I couldn't get that last move in. It's the computer's fault. But, you know, shout out to David Fry for joining at the last possible moment. He's been a good sport about it. Uh, but yeah, he's clearly not happy to have lost in that way. So while he reacts, we are glad to be joined on the ground again in uh, Goodyear, Arizona. So we're gonna uh, bring in Gab once more. Gab, how's it going? What's uh, the latest there uh, in, the, uh, in the scene with all the players? Well, it's getting loud. And that's why some of the audio has been a little fun here. Thanks to our fans watching, dealing with some of the technical issues. But definitely the emotions are running high. I don't know if you guys caught it on the wide shot earlier, but David Fry took his brand new, really spiffy chess hat, by the way, and chucked it. Absolutely just nailed Austin Hedges right in the chest with his hat. It had to be like six feet away, and it it was so audible. I thought he threw a Miller Lite at him, to be honest. It hit him right in the chest and fell his knees. Made his theatrics about it. Um, so the guys are definitely having fun with it. But you can see on their faces, as you guys can tell with the computers in front of them, just the look. Stephen Kwan was telling me earlier his heart was pounding playing PX. And, uh, you know, this is Stephen's wheelhouse. I think a lot of players have been saying if he loses this tournament, there will be a lot of locker room public shaming to go on with uh, Stephen Kwan. But you guys will notice with his game, it's a lot similar to his style of baseball play. He's a very patient batter. He sees a lot of pitches, rarely swings at the first pitch. His average is 6%, and the league average for comparison is like closer to 30%. So he's a patient guy. But with the time restraints, you know, it's forcing guys to make more aggressive moves. And we'll, we'll see as the pressure continues on Quan and the rest of the fellas. But definitely the morale is loud over here. So much so it's conflicting with our technical issues. Um, I will say this, though, last thing, guys. Steven said he wasn't as much of a trash talker. I beg to differ. I'm hearing some roasting out there. Um, he even roasted me. He's like, hey, Gab, just so you know, you're getting cooked in the comments for the audio. <laughs> I'm like, you know what? Thank you so much. I, um, uh, I really appreciate you letting me know that, that we're all going to get roasted out here today. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you, you know, they're just a lot of fun. The spirits are light. And again, thank you guys for including me in this. It's, it's been a really fun afternoon. We'll see what else unfolds. Thanks a lot, Gab. I had one more question just because we really appreciate the on the ground mic. That's really adding some liveliness to the games. I mean, was there anything that we missed maybe uh, until now? Because it's great hearing the trash talk. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying to see. Um, 
what what did, I'm trying to think. What did you guys miss? Yeah, you missed the the throw of the hat. Um, I think you saw Schneeman put absolutely put his head in his hands at the end of uh, one of the match. But he was the winner, which I was confused. Which it, I guess it's just a testament to how emotionally invested you are. Even when you win, you're just like you're holding your breath. Um, yep. So definitely some loud exhales. I'm trying to think. Oh yeah, Hedges. What was it? Oh yeah, Hedges is on beer like four, I think. He, he keeps being like, he's like, I think I'm gonna need another. I asked him if he was working out after this. He's like, oh no, good, I'm done for the day. So he's definitely uh, making sure he has no shortage of Miller Lite hydration today, you guys. I don't know, I think that's about it, but I'm gonna keep my, my ears open for any more trash talking that's going on. <laughs> well, Gab, I mean, it's so fun to hear what's happening on the ground. Uh, we will uh, get back to you in a bit, but thanks so much for keeping us updated. I hope you're having fun too. So uh, yeah, keep I, enjoying I the, the scene. <laughs> Thank you. Of course. Well, the players, they are having what seems to be the time of their lives, especially your man, Aman. Uh, we, your, your man, Austin Hedges, is having the best time. But Bo Naylor, uh, he says, you know, I'm, I'm in this too. Okay. Yeah, this, I love this that. is Maybe great. We do bring Bobby like, back just to hear later. the uh, hear the mic now. I'm looking forward to these next matchups. And what was the most interesting to me to hear from Gab was that actually Stephen Kwan is a trash talk. You know, he likes to present himself as Mr. Fundamental, Mr. Solid, both on the diamond and on the chessboard. But at the end of the day, he, he gets into it with the guys just like the rest of them. So love to see that. Oh, it's great. And we heard from uh, our, you know, University of Akron student who graduated uh, from John Marshall High School, Akshar Patel. And he was saying that they force him to talk trash. But these players, these athletes, they're not forced to focus on the chessboard because we are off. We see in the top left, Stephen Kwan only needs a draw. But Amon, you called it. I don't know if there will be a single draw in this entire competition. <laughs> Meanwhile, Bo Naylor in the top right against Daniel Schneeman finally plays his first move and we do have liftoff in both of these champions bracket matches that's right i i'm gonna stand by it no draws in in the whole event uh certainly not from uh my guy hedges you know the i i think as the uh, miller lights go up the draw potential goes way down so <laughs> certainly not from him <laughs> Well, uh, you want to hedge your bets because it looks like he's in trouble in this third game, Amon, where Stephen Kwan, I mean, he's not joking around. He may talk some trash that uh, Gab informed us of, but it seems like he's letting his moves do the talking and he is just in a great position in this third game. Yeah, this one, uh, <laughs> I think this is the Miller Lite Gambit uh, right here <laughs> because this one might be over before it starts if he defends that Rook with Rook B8. Because, you know, if, if you notice that, I feel like you, you naturally default to saving your material. Ooh. There it is. And will we see the end of the game? <laughs> he, he sees it. Yeah, I think that uh, they should enjoy a drink together after this match. It's check checkmate and what? You know what they say, Amon? When you see checkmate, look for better. Now his king is out of the center, so any now coach he's he has, gonna he's, find it. he's forced to find it. His queen is yeah. under attack. Checkmate in one. But, you know, those puzzles are a lot easier when someone tells you that it's mate. Oh, he we still doesn't got a game spot. here. Yeah, we do. The Black King has to slide up. By the way, Amon, I didn't even notice this, but Black's also down a pawn. So somewhere along the way, the B pawn was was uh, given up. Yeah, it's, it's easy to be fooled by this evaluation bar because it's sky high with an advantage for white. But if you actually break down the raw material count, it's not that bad for Austin Hedges, right? It's just everything put together and, it, and the king in the middle, like that terrible position. Yeah, it's why you want your king castle. Look at the white king, safe and sound. Those pawns are in front of it. No checks available to black. The black king, on the other hand, a knight at some point can leap forward. I wouldn't do... Oh, I was about to say, I wouldn't do that now because it actually drops a piece that rook on b8. It survived, and it's going to play an important role in this game. You can't underestimate the Miller Lite Gambit here, uh, Robert. This is paying dividends, and now Stephen Kwan might actually be so in trouble here after Queen takes. Okay, I was going to say, if Queen takes, he should probably try to avoid that. Oh! Oh! He hung the rook! Is he going to spot it, though? That's long range. 
No, no, he didn't spot that. And I mean, Amon, that's difficult to see when your king's in check. Your first instinct is more so get my king out of check, not can totally. I capture the piece that's checking me. Totally. Yeah. And uh, honestly, looking at the cams right there, it almost looks like he kind of told him about it. There's nothing worse <laughs> than being told by your opponent, oh, yeah, uh, could have won the whole game right there, but I guess he missed it. And let's not forget, they don't have the evaluation bar. So black is up a knight for a pawn, but where is that knight? Oh, it's undeveloped. That rook right. in the corner, the bishop on its starting square. White's pieces are actually much better coordinated, and there's big threats down the open e-file that Stephen Kwan will likely go after. Oh, look at the fundamental professional move there, b3. It's actually a really, really good one as well. He's just a classy player. We heard from Gab. His chess style is just like his uh, baseball style. And he's a defensive player on the field. We know that he's a two-time gold glove winner. And it seems that he is just fundamentally super sound. He trapped that rook. Yeah, and actually, uh, <laughs> wow. That's actually a really impressive move right here from Austin Hedges. To think counterattack when you've got your own piece hanging. He's actually creating a square that that rook can move to safety. That's a really impressive counterattack. I wasn't expecting it. Uh, it's a really good move. And now you see the evaluation is starting to agree with Austin's decision. The rook can slide over, and it does. The, for now, it goes back in White's favor. But mm -hmm. the d5 pawn can be captured soon. The c2 pawn may be loose. So now White has many things to worry about. And Amon, as I pass to you, I'm looking at the clock. Steven yeah. Kwan down to just over two minutes. A huge lead for Austin Hedges when it comes to time management. Yeah, that's the thing um, that the Miller Lights will always uh, keep you doing. It's up on the clock, Robert. You, you, you never uh, play this gambit and end up low on time. And if there's one weakness in Quan's game, I think it might be the time. Uh, Austin Hedges is not the first opponent to get a lead on the clock against Stephen Quan. So uh, perhaps something for these guys to exploit if they're looking to get a win against them. And an another quick move, hitting the queen. The queen slides away. And now is about time to use that rook. And he takes mm -hmm. the central pawn. Hedges is playing a pretty good game. There have been some massive blunders. We're not going to pretend like they haven't happened. You can see underneath the board the swings of evaluation. But I yep. think he has the right approach in a game. He doesn't he can't draw. He has to win. He must win this game. He's doing the right thing and using the clock as the 17th piece. That's right. And now I'm looking at the pieces here. And although Black's completely okay, it's the mobilization that Stephen Kwan has with all his pieces. Everyone's joining the attack. There's a really difficult move to spot. Bishop takes g7 here, which is why the engine's probably going crazy. But I think more realistically, Robert, this is a great move. Yeah, taking on g7, really hard to find. You sacrifice a bishop to pick up a bunch of material. And the bad thing of what Austin Hedges is doing. He's taking pawns. What happens if you take pawns? You open files. Rook c1 coming in, the e file, the c file, the bishop may land a check at some point, and that's a good aggressive attacking move from Stephen Kwan. Mm -hmm. If he wants to get the bishop involved, though, it's easy to forget that that weirdly placed rook in the center of the board actually kind of covers things pretty nicely. What a great defensive piece. You're right. It, it does keep every single attacking option unavailable for white no rook to d1 as you point out no bishop a5 checks so look at the time now yep. we're talking serious issues for stephen kwan yeah because guess what it's like all his pieces are on great squares I, if i didn't know better i might play h3 here because i just don't know what to do oh and he offered a queen trade but also dropped his bishop so if i'm hedges Okay, he doesn't even pause for a second. I was going to say, <laughs> you think for a little bit, and then I try to figure it out. He just goes right for it. Yeah, no, at this point, if that queen moves, uh, it could move to a square that continues to attack that rook on e1. Because if the rook goes down to b8, all of a sudden, you leave that rook on e1 hanging for, for later. Ooh, that's a great move, though. He's putting pressure on the rook in the center, but also going for that last rank, keeping everything coordinated. Ooh, he's moving so quickly, Amon. Yeah, now he's got to go this way. Hopefully he sees that he's got to run because he can't go to e6. I guess the danger move would be king d8. Run, get out of there. Run, 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 go. But unfortunately for Austin Hedges, he's a catcher. What running is he doing? And oh, there it goes. He, he has under control. So Amon, he's clearly your guy. I'm, I'm trying to get involved in a little bit of trash talking and I'm just eating my words. 
Look, what did I say? He set this up a long time ago. That is the special. Queen D2. He's got the animation on cam there. And look at Steven Kwan just shaking his head like, what was that? Like, how did that happen? But for Austin Hedges, he owes nobody any expl explanations. Oh, look, he's right over to his yeah. cam. <laughs> he's, he's talking trash to him. That's exactly what he's doing. Yeah. There's nothing worse than, like, losing a game can you imagine, Robert, you lose an over-the-board <laughs> chess game and your opponent's immediately in your eardrum? Oh, this is awesome. I can't <laughs> wait to hear what's actually being said. But Stephen Kwan, he's trying his best to ignore him. Impossible when Austin Hedges is in your ear. Totally. And that was the first loss of the event handed to Stephen Kwan. So Hedges, he, he only got one of the many wins that he needs to make a full comeback. But definitely feeling the energy and uh, inspiring him to make this comeback happen. Well, look at the other game in the top right, you know, Bo Naylor and Daniel Schneeman. Uh, these yep. players trying to get to the champions bracket finals. There's a white king that is sprinting into black's position, but white doesn't have a queen that I can see. I know it's a little hard to see the top right a game on our screen, but Bo Naylor is down a queen and Daniel Schneeman is trying to go for checkmate. Yeah, the king is uh, being used as an aggressive piece there. King d7. Um, honestly, if he coordinates that rook, yeah, he kind of is, right? If that rook <laughs> sort of gets down there. Look, I'm an optimist. <laughs> yeah, no, and you've uh, had some correct calls today, but look at that from Daniel Schneeman. Uh, he Super doesn't good. care about your optimism. He is going for the checks. And he takes that rook off the board. Now, all white has is this lone rook just wandering about. But checkmating the white king is difficult. Yeah, and it, it's kind of funny to say, but it's easier to move your king away from checks than it is to give the appropriate. So, oh my goodness, look at the time. Four seconds for black. He needs to let him wow, he lost his rook, though. And that should help black's chances with checkmate. He's got to make one move. Oh, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? He couldn't oh, make one move. And you saw the fist pumps, and we actually saw the camera reaction before it appeared on the board. And Daniel Schneeman, he still hasn't moved. He didn't get a last move off Amon. He is frozen. He's in shock. And, I mean, how can you not smile after that? Bo Naylor just experienced, I'm, and I'm glad he did. He really got to experience online chess at its finest that is my friend a dirty flag congratulations and that's my second chess bra sighting of slug champs because we know the chess bras they love themselves a good dirty flag daniel Schneeman, <laughs> on the other hand is looking it's like are you kidding me he was up the house he had every single extra piece and yet he lost yep. the game yep there were multiple uh, checkmates in a couple moves to happen there as well these these matchups have been really entertaining. This last round really picked it up. Robert, it feels like as the competition goes on, the players are getting more into it, more lively. And hey, we have some results there in the champion semifinals. Two to one in both matchups, whereas in the consolation semifinals, we had some sweeps again. Three nil in the consolation semis for Tristan McKenzie and Tanner Bybee. That should set up a match between those two in the Constellation Finals, and then in the Champions Semifinals, it continues. So, oh, what matches we have? It's been already an electric day, and I'm just curious, so I'm gonna waste no further time. What was Austin Hedges saying live in Goodyear, Arizona? That's the question that everyone wants to answer to. Gab, can you fill us in? What did Austin tell Steven? Grab my hand. Oh, am I going? Good. Oh, sorry, guys, I couldn't hear you. But I will say this I could hear Austin Hedges, his bellowing, yeah, he was screaming it after he beat Stephen Kwan. I think the, the building shook. There were some expletives by Kwan that I won't repeat. But of course, in perfect Hedges style, he got right in his face, told him, I think it was, quote, you want this noise, son? <laughs> and uh, so they were, yeah, they were going back and forth out there what else what else did hedgy say i know that i heard steven say he was way too over caffeinated i don't know if that sounds like a little bit of an excuse to me um mm -hmm. hedges said i guess all it took was three miller lights to beat you <laughs> so they were going back and i guess it was what juan had 31 percent accuracy and then um uh austin had 30 
34 and 31. That's what they were saying. So I guess it was like, what, a bad game? <laughs> but, uh, he, was. And you know what? Austin said he doesn't care if he loses the rest of his life. He just wanted everyone to know. He just wanted, he's like, hey, world. What do you say? 98%? 98%. Get a 98% chance of losing that. I don't know whose statistics those were. Maybe it was just the team betting on him <laughs> versus Juan. Um, but yeah, pretty exciting stuff from him. And you saw Bo's react there to win six seconds left. He's like, I'm sweating right now. Yeah, I think that's like one of the most exciting things that can happen in chess. It feels so greasy. I don't know what the baseball equivalent is, but he basically won a chess game with 0 0.6 seconds and no pieces. So uh, that's quite impressive. We call that, that in chess a that dirty sounds like a, That sounds like a walk-off win. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's tense. There, there's only so much time in the game left, and somebody just hits a walk-off winner there. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> I love that we can still hear them. What are they saying right now, Gab? <laughs> Let's see. It's crazy because they get so silent and locked in during the chess, which I guess I thought they'd be like jawing back and forth. No, completely locked in. Um, it's a little loud in here, but um, let's see. It's, it's hard because I'm a little further away from them. Could you hear Andrew? Oh, I, I have a snack. They're just having a snack break, it looks like. <laughs> you got to refuel out here. Listen, the brain needs fuel. So does the body. But in something as uh, mentally rigorous as chess, these guys are refueling. I'm jealous, honestly. I mean, Gab, why don't you uh, also enjoy uh, some refreshments? I wish that I could do the same. But thank you so much for keeping us updated on the ground. And we'll check in with you in a bit. Thanks, Gab. Sounds good. <laughs> Awesome to hear the players' reactions and what they're getting up to. And we saw some epic reactions from the players after this game. Look, Look at, at that. Austin Hedges. Yeah, he is in Stephen Kwan's grill, <laughs> letting him know who the boss is. Yeah, he's, he's going over and he's checking out. Because Stephen, at that point, is probably looking at his own game review, right? He's letting the clubhouse know, I took out Stephen Kwan. I love it. And Bo Naylor, what a nail biter that was. He wins on time with pretty much no pieces remaining on the board, except yep. for a few pawns. And you see him and Austin Hedges celebrating together. Of course, those two would be a dynamic duo. Yeah, that's the, the rowdy side of the of the playing hall there. As we look at the champions bracket, and uh, obviously we don't have winners of these matches yet, but two to one in both matchups, Steven Kwan, Bo Naylor can both win with a win next. And we see that in the consolation bracket, we are heading towards a final of Kristen McKenzie and Tanner Bybee. So that should be a fun matchup. And the third place match will be Will Brennan and David Fry. So those two would like to get on the scoreboard, as they say. So uh, Gab gave us some great insights on how the players are feeling on the ground. We'll see how mm -hmm. they can prove themselves on the chessboard. But look at the top. These two matches continue, Amon. We do not know our champions bracket finalists. Yeah, and it does. Uh, I, I thought one of the more interesting things that Gab mentioned to us there um, in that last segment was that, and this is so true, it does get oddly silent and the players kind of focus up when the games are in progress, Robert, which is so interesting. That's exactly how it works in real tournaments. Even if you're friends with someone, you're good buddies, no, there's, uh, there's always uh, this air of seriousness when the games actually start. My jaw just dropped because we have to go into the Stephen Kwan game. Aman, have you been secretly giving Stephen Kwan some lessons? This is <laughs> unbelievable. That was crazy. Yeah, and I think Stephen Kwan, as we look at this game right here, if I go back just a few moves, just to appreciate what happened there, you'll, you'll notice he actually gave up his bishop on purpose. And believe me, he knows what he's doing here. You can just tell this is a trap, an opening trick at the beginning of the game. Although he gave up that bishop, he takes with check, kind of luring the king away. And what is this, a stolen base or something, uh, Robert? Queen takes d1 and a huge advantage for Steven. And you know Austin Hedges by now. He is going to have zero respect for the fact that Stephen Kwan prepared himself to victory. I mean, come yeah. on, right? This is like mano a mano. Like, you're supposed to be going at it on your Try own. hard. Yeah, what a, what 
a sweat, right? Like, that's just not cool. You've turned me against Stephen Kwan. I mean, that's just a, a ball player that everybody loves. He's such a uh, great uh, athlete. And now he's showing that he's a established and studied chess player, Monzo. In all seriousness, we have to appreciate that, that he doesn't just, you know, play and hope that he finds the best moves. He has studied some openings. He really has. So that that was a, a look into, you know, maybe just a little bit of difference between some of the players that shows the experience of Steven. Uh, back against the wall, Austin Hedges, how about E6? Like, he just kind of got styled on by Steven Kwan, and he still has the, you know, foresight to think aggressively and create his own tactics to try and come back in this game. And look at that, dropping his bishop back to stop the queen. If that queen takes the pawn... We could see Stephen Kwan drop his queen on c4. That would not be good. Instead, he backtracks and take that rook in the corner. What's our material count on? Will white have a minor piece and a rook? So the bishop and a rook for the queen. That's right. Um, honestly, more chances than you might think, especially because that bishop will join the action again. So obviously the computer here, Robert, will really favor black mostly because all of the pieces are developed. The king is safe and you have the extra queen. So all that in mind, Austin's in a tough position, but you know, it's not always about what the computer says. Sometimes it's the psychology, it's you know how it feels between the players. Let's see. Well, you know what we're going to see, Amon, is extra innings or just extra chess because Bo Naylor, Daniel Schneeman, two to two. They have tied their match. A very quick fourth game of the match to even things up. So uh, Daniel Schneeman and Bo Naylor, they'll continue in their match to see who goes on the finals. But for now, I guess uh, our attention is on Hedges and Quan. We'll update everybody with what happened in that game between uh, Schneeman and Naylor soon because whoa, what a quick ending that was. Mm -hmm. And wow, what a great move there by Stephen Quan. It can be tough to you know play a retreating queen move sometimes. You just feel like unproductive, like, oh, I shouldn't be going backwards away from the action. But I think that's actually a really, really impressive move there. It's especially hard to retreat when Hedges is probably talking some smack, you know, like, oh, come on, look at you backing up. Uh, but yep. it's the best decision that he could have made. He is bringing his queen away from the action. Uh, that's what happens with queens. They get kicked by less valuable pieces. They have to move, and you spend a lot of turns uh, just shuffling about. But the highlight that you just showed, Amon, that will yep. be a great move. He, he goes knight of six. He's hitting the bishop in the corner. The bishop should probably save itself by taking the knight. Uh, but white... You know, the game is not over. I mean, he is fighting on here. He has a knight and a rook for a queen. That's quite a lot of material. It is. And if he gets castled, he'll finally... Ooh, he needed to castle there. Yeah, I was going to say, Steven's not missing that rook from long range. And you can see the reaction there. That hurts. Yeah, you know, as much as he's been joking, you can tell he wanted to get the second game in a row, but he is mm -hmm. going to lose all of his pieces now. Uh, once Black takes the bishop, the rook in the corner is gone next. And Stephen Kwan, he is moving on to the finals. I think that much is clear, unless yep. I mean the craziest chess of all, ha of all time happens. Yeah, no, it would have to be, a, oh, okay. I mean, you know, not taking that rook in the corner, that's uh, the start maybe of the, the mistakes. But I feel like if that's your mistake, then you're going to win every chess game this event. Yeah, I mean, the Siemens mistake earlier was giving up his rook in the corner, but he was already up a queen. So I feel like the types of mistakes he's been making, uh, they don't often have terrible consequences, except in game three of this match, where he blundered the house and was checkmated. That's right. Yeah, there's, there really is just uh, no way to survive here, but... Austin's going to move his king around. Tons of time for Stephen Kwan. He will be the first to move on to the finals here as well i believe and yeah you mentioned 2-2 in the other matchup so that'll be an intense uh tiebreaker that will be fun for sure uh as the time controls they get shorter and well i think the players they're going to enjoy that even more they just want to flag each other we already saw that happen uh, earlier so they don't really care how it's done as long as they win their game they can have one pawn on the board that's all they want mm-hmm yeah, funny enough, uh, I was going to say there's not really a mate here, but what a great move there. H6 setting up a checkmate on the G5 square. And I think I hear some, well, I wish I could hear, but I see some <laughs> chatter between the players. I think that Stephen Kwan's accuracy, uh, that's the only thing I need to see. 
is 89.4% after Queen G5. Checkmate. He ends the match. And what a game that was. And look at Austin Hedges. Uh, he's like, congrats, man. You, know, you earned it. I, I think he's doing that thing where you politely talk trash. Yeah, exactly. That's that's the, uh, you know, at the end of the day, the sportsmanship. I think the guys, <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> You were talking about sportsmanship. I was too. And I saw him just carrying like three beers. <laughs> hey, you know, the sportsmanship comes from somewhere. You know? <laughs> He's having the time of his life, even though he just lost the match three to one to Stephen Kwan. Austin Hedges is uh, the star of the show at the moment. But Kwan moves on to the champions finals where he'll await yep. the winner of Bo Naylor and Daniel Schneeman. So uh, we see all matches except for Naylor and Schneeman are finished. Come on, 2-2, a tied match. That's uh, what the people paid for. Yeah, this is going to be now a pretty exciting finish there. We haven't really had a tied match. And uh, thank you very much, Robert. We haven't had a tied game either. Still, no draws. No draws. And we are getting into extra innings in this match between Bo Naylor and Daniel Schneeman. These two, they're locked. 2-2 two, two tie at the moment, but there can only be one player moving on to the finals. Will it be Naylor? Will it be Schneeman? Uh, I'm curious to see how these players will react because, Amana, it's difficult for professionals in chess to go to quicker time controls. For these baseball players, will they be able to manage their clock in addition to managing all the tactics and complications on the board? Yeah, I think at, uh, I think at this point, the, the point is... These guys are not going to handle this that well. It is going to get messy. Um, so as we get set up for this game here, Schneeman and Naylor are now dropping down and playing a little bit quicker. But just because the time control is quicker doesn't mean they will actually be playing quicker. And they might uh, suffer as a result with some serious time pressure. And we see the players, they're getting locked in. They're ready to play, and they're, uh, they're teammates behind them. <laughs> I yep. love that. You see it right behind them. They just want to be on camera. I think that's really what's happening there. Uh, but both players have teammates in the background, and the game is underway. Schneeman with the white pieces. What do you make of this start? Yeah, it's a three-minute game. Um, immediately, I notice uh, you know, the hood's down for Naylor. That says something. He's serious now. Uh, from what I'm seeing here, definitely I like it for Schneeman, but I do think that for Naylor, it's much easier to play. Sometimes cramped positions, yeah, you don't have to work as hard. And you see in the upper left-hand side of our screens, the winner advances. It's no longer best of four. You don't get those second chances. You you lose, you go home. You're gone. Mm -hmm. Well, not actually. You stay in Goodyear, Arizona <laughs> for spring training. But look at this. Uh, we have some trades. This actually looks like... Uh, Sicilian Nidorf. I mean, this is a typical looking position. So neither side has made any huge mistakes yet. Yeah. One thing I'll say about this uh, tiebreaker game, as opposed to the other ones, is I do think it's a heavy, heavy weight on the clock. Like, yeah, the clock has always been important. But I, I think here, whoever controls the, the time on the clock controls the match outcome. If Bo Naylor plays, I thought... I was going to say, if he brought his knight out to help trap that queen, that would have been something. And we did watch uh, these two get into time scramble a few games ago that went Bo Naylor's way. So mm -hmm. I think you have to be really, really careful here if you're Daniel Schneeman because those memories, they can haunt you. Yeah. And now let's see if he trusts his opponent. Yeah, I was about to say, I have a feeling he will. That was a completely free piece on g5 but just the speed at which Bo Naylor played it he was like okay yep uh you're attacking my queen i'm gonna move but look at schneeman's clock he still has over two minutes to nailers about one minute 45 and white is a couple pawns ahead i would say the good news for black is all the dark squares are yours your opponent has a light square bishop maneuver yep. that knight around go back to e6 to go forward to f4 or d4 use those dark squares and try to create some problems and Whoa. honestly, both guys are kind of doing what they should be. White is moving that outside pass pawn. If you're going to take all Black's pawns, you may as well push yours to make some threats. And Black is doing what I think he should be doing, pushing in the center, as you said, Robert. I love it. He's going after the White King and just creating some problems. White is a bit cramped right now, and the Queen is active. If this Rook, as you're pointing out, a Rook lifted join the party, that's going to hurt. Mm -hmm. I feel like he's probably going to slide it over to F5 because it... I mean, that looks like it's doing a little bit more, but 
ultimately these two pieces need to coordinate. And if I'm white here, you know, close my eyes and just uh, put the, push him, baby, as Yasser likes to say. And Steven is clearly a chess bra as well. How many chess bras are in this uh, event? They all know what to do, pushing it to A7. What I didn't as tell you, Robert, go. was that, you know, we actually have a, a full chess bra roster uh, in the event. <laughs> Well, I know that Joey Votto, uh, you know, he is a chess bra. He's uh, been mm -hmm. seen with you all and is a dedicated chess player. Now the Queens come off here. So I think Schneeman, he can join the roster. Absolutely. You know, uh, fully, fully welcome here. And uh, this, this pawn right there is just single-handedly winning the game. Black has a lot of missing pawns. And I don't think that uh, Bo Naylor is going to be able to manage anything. And look at this, bringing a rook to an open file, hitting the so knight. Impressive. I really like that move. I, if he finds a, oh, I was about to say, if he finds a way to put pressure on the pin piece, I was going to be super impressed. And now he's winning that knight. Yeah, I mean, I almost want to uh, take a moment here and just appreciate, like, what are we seeing from Daniel Schiemann? This game is an absolute masterclass, start to finish. I think this is one of the best complete games that I've seen in the whole event. And it's over. And Daniel Schneeman, I mean, that was an awesome game from him. You can look underneath the board. It was one-sided. He was just better, and then he converted it into a win. So Bo Naylor, yep. he is set down into the third, fourth place matchup. But Daniel Schneeman earned this match victory. What a game. Yeah, that was incredible. Um, it felt like Bo Naylor didn't do that much wrong. Like, oh, he lost the pawn here, lost the pawn there. At the level that, that we're seeing from the players, you wouldn't think that's a big deal, but no, they those pawns added up, and you see the difference there as Schneeman takes the win against Naylor. Whew, that was an awesome semi-final matchup. It leaves us with Quan and Schneeman in the finals. That will certainly be a good one to watch. And speaking of good things to watch, I don't know why my face is on this graph. Yeah, who's they that could guy? have chosen so many better participants, but do not miss the Team Chess Battle event coming to your screens on February 21st. That's tomorrow. 16 of the biggest names in chess are partnering up and miking up for this banter style knockout event with $25,000 on the line. With all-star pairings like Gotham Chess and Ikaru, Wesley So and Alice Lee. We also got me and Danya in the mix. We have Eric Hansen and Jordan Van Forest, Chess Bros representing. It mm -hmm. is going to be an incredibly fun event. It all starts tomorrow, February 21st. So use the command battle in chat now for everything you need to know. And as we return, we know that our special guest knows a thing or two about teams because he's the coach of a very impressive team. We do have a guest appearance from Cameron Cutler, who has been the chess coach for seven years at John Marshall High School. Cameron, welcome. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you guys doing? I can't complain. We're watching uh, MLB athletes play chess. Um, you know, can you set the scene for us? Because your players have uh, been able to participate in uh, national championships as well as take on these athletes. What has this whole experience been like for you? Oh, it's been awesome. I mean, the kids have really just turned into like local local celebrities. And uh, it's nice that we get to build this relationship with the Guardians and they get back to the community. And it's just been it's been awesome. And Cameron, I also wanted to ask you, I mean, you've been the chess coach for now seven years at John Marshall. I mean, how have you seen the club develop? It must be in its, uh, you know, at its peak right now, is that fair to say? But how have those la last seven years been for you seeing the chess club develop? Oh, it's been awesome. We really have have grown. Um, my, uh, my first year there, you know, we had won uh, one student um, and, and now we have about 12 kids. Uh, that show up regularly and you know we've really we've really built something special and Kevin why don't you talk to us about how you know you started with this small club that has grown but now you're working with professional athletes seeing your kids play against these superstars I mean, like take us through that what has that meant to you and uh, to your school and all the players it's just been it's been really fun um there's been this relationship that's grown and um it's nice because the uh, our our players here at school challenge the guardians, and they uh, kind of in turn challenge us back. So we have this rivalry going on that has just made everyone better chess players. <laughs> that is awesome to hear. I also wanted to ask. I don't know uh, anything about this, but is there any extra kind of baseball interest at the John Marshall High School just as a result of the collaboration? Obviously, chess 
is kind of growing between uh, the two communities. But uh, any extra baseball stars at the school now? Well, it's it's funny because our school baseball team gets really jealous um, because the uh, the chess kids get to get to do all the stuff with the guardians and the and our baseball players. Um, you know, they always talk about, hey, I just want to join chess so I can be a part of this. <laughs> wow, that's a lovely role reversal of uh, my high school days for sure. You know, when uh, the, yep. the athletes, they uh, uh, were never really jealous of the chess players, but it's cool to see that. And well, Kim, why don't you stick around with us for a bit? I just want to talk to you about these matchups, you know, your experiences with these players. Uh, we do know our finalists. It's going to be Stephen Kwan against Daniel Schneeman. And we heard um, earlier we had... Uh, Akshar on and he was saying he's done quite well against Steven historically. So uh, what do you know about these athletes as, as chess players, as people, and who do you think is the favorite in this champions finals? Well, um, I think like most people would say that Steven's going to be the favorite. Um, but, uh, you know, Daniel's been playing some, some really nice chess that last game there. He was, he was kind of cooking. So, um, I think it'll, I think it'll be good. I'd love to see it go to go to five games. Um, still waiting to see a draw. I don't know. Maybe we'll see one this round. Yeah, I was, I was saying like, I think there just won't be a draw the entire tournament just from the, the way that these guys play chess and go at each other. I, I have to ask you, have you seen a draw between these guys and any of the players at the school? Because I'm starting to think they're just not capable of it. I don't. You know, I usually, usually me, if I'm playing, I'm happy with the draw, but, uh, uh, no, these players, I think everyone just kind of plays to win. And, uh, you know, I don't think anyone wants to accept a draw. I think they're just, they're playing to win the whole time. Well, Cameron, let me it. ask you about something you just said, where, you know, some of the players on your, your roster on your chess team, uh, they, you know, may be stronger players than you. What's that experience like, you know, mentoring them and seeing that growth of players getting stronger and stronger? That must make you quite proud. Uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I am, I have been stuck at about a 1000 rating um, for years now. And I just, I can't get over that hump. Um, but to see my other players able to, to make it over that hump, um, and uh, Akshar, who you spoke to earlier, he, he's really, really good. When I first met Akshar, um, he was rated about an 800 player. Um, and now uh, when he graduated with me, he was around a 1700. I think he may even be an 1800 player now. Um, so just to see him grow, um, it just it makes me very proud. We have uh, we have some really, really good chess players. We have some kids that work very hard and, and study the game and um, it just, you know, as a coach, it, it's really nice to see, um, you know, the, the kids are, are very humbling um, by, uh, you know, I'll play a game with them and, and I'll get smoked. But um, it, it's really nice to see them grow as chess players. Yeah, I feel like oh, that's dude. kind of the uh, that's kind of the goal at the end of the day. Like no one likes to lose a game of chess. But as the coach, I think ultimately you're you're happy to see it. You'll take one on the chin uh, to see the, the kids succeed. I'm always, always willing to pass the torch. <laughs> oh, well, Cameron, it's so great to catch up with you. We loved hearing from your former players, and we just uh, are looking forward to continued success uh, for your team and also this connection with the Cleveland Guardians. So thanks so much for joining us here. Awesome, guys. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, Cameron. Of course. That is Cameron Cutler, the, the chess coach at John Marshall High School, who has helped foster this connection between his players over the years and the Cleveland Guardians. And we are mm -hmm. in the finals of the Slug Champs on the top left of our screen. We see Stephen Kwan and Daniel Schneeman. They are slugging it out for the grand prize in Amman. I mean, the game looks relatively level at the moment between these two. It does. I, I'm just thinking, like, so so cool to hear the, uh, the insights from the coach himself what stood out to me there robert was you know him saying oh yeah the uh the baseball team at the school is actually super jealous of the chess club it's like man back in my high school days that was a sentence that could not be formed that was not a thing well that's why you took up chess boxing to you know show all those bullies that you exactly. had it in you <laughs> exactly yeah now can i go back with all that knowledge uh, capability can i go back to chess club now
<laughs> well, chess is uh, definitely increasing in popularity uh, thanks to coaches like uh, Coach Cutler and you know his whole team. As he said, he started with almost no students, and, and I've read that students come from uh, such diverse backgrounds from all over mm -hmm. the globe, uh, often speaking different languages other than English. So to bring the team together like that and have them uh, play celebrities and perhaps their own heroes, it's really a wonderful sight. And I think, uh, you know, it's a special shout out to a person like Coach Cutler to uh, have that happen. And, you know, he did say that it was everything he's seen, Stephen Kwan is the favorite. Amon, as we dive back into the chessboard, it looks yeah. like Kwan just grabbed the central pawn and he's snacking. He's up one. Yeah, and check out him playing the sort of calm, measured move, pawn to c3, just to blunt that bishop's diagonal before grabbing the pawn. Uh it feels like Stephen Kwan time and time again is reminding us uh, not only, you know, that he's a great player, but he definitely has a deep understanding of some of the broader concepts of chess. So it's, it's really fun to watch him play. Well, the most fun that I know that you were having, and I think a lot of the fans was watching uh, Austin Hedges, it seems like he's gone. He lost the match and he's like, yeah, I'm done with this. So as we await further confirmation, it looks like Bo Naylor will take the third place prize. And oh, there's a prize right now. A rook on e8 for that knight on d6. Will Stephen Kwan take that? See, you know, average uh, chess bra reaction. Lose a game. Peace. <laughs> 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 you know, I know what can we say? Um, <laughs> we'll take a, it though. He was entertaining while he was here, and uh, you know, we'll we love him for that. Yeah, it was memorable, right? Like he yep. made sure that we will not forget his appearance in Slug Champs anytime soon. But oh, that rook! It remains on the board and. Stephen Kwan may regret that. That rook could have been captured by the knight. Now it slides forward. And I'm, I see some blunder potential here. If that white knight is ever to leave its square, mm -hmm. the queen is not defended enough time. So I, I feel like uh, there are a lot of possibilities for Daniel Schneeman now that Stephen Kwan did not take his rook. Absolutely. And when the bishop goes back, there is kind of a, uh, a meaningful threat here that bishop takes, pawn takes, and then the rook takes. It's not an easy decision to then play queen takes rook, even though it would be an okay move. That's not that normal to do. Pawn to f5 here. We'll see if he can play a move like that because maybe he's thinking too reactive. Oh, f5. That's uh, going to hunt this trapped rook. And oh, he walked into a pin. Yeah. Okay, he's only got, I mean, he's got a few moves he can play, but rook takes is the most normal. Daniel Schumann's right back in this, Robert. We were just talking about blunder potential. And Quan is lucky to have Rook takes Bishop because mm -hmm. you know, this looks like a position uh, where you don't have options. He's shaking his head. Uh, Quan doesn't see what to do right now because he realizes that his queen is in trouble. Wow, and it's almost like it feels like maybe he's the one that he's too good for his own good. Like <laughs> he saw the pin potential there, so he assumed maybe he was losing a piece. And I like the way you just framed that. Look at this. Rook on e1 is hanging, but first Schneeman takes this pawn that was hitting his queen. Mm. But there was a rook hanging with check that could have been grabbed. And now the white queen successfully defends that rook on d1. Everything mm -hmm. is connected. Aman, I don't think we'll see our first draw, but I have to ask you, might we? No, not a chance. Not a chance. <laughs> uh, I think here we have a, although completely balanced position, there's just still so much opportunity for mistakes to happen. Ironically, even if the queens trade off the board and it's like complete dead draw with kings and pawns, I feel like those are the end games that people definitely lose. <laughs> Look at the teammates right behind Stephen Kwan there, yeah. staring at the screen, trying to figure out what's going on. I feel like he does have a small tablet. We'll need confirmation from the team on site. But the way that uh, you know his teammates have been looking at his screen, it feels like the screen is not easy to see. Ooh, it's almost checkmate. That's almost checkmate. Yeah, he's bailed out by this move and immediately takes the pawn, not there to just trade with him. Black is now up one and make it two pawns. Once that a three pawn drops, if white blocks the queen, trade queens, liquidate while ahead. This would be super instructive. And that's why Stephen Kwan slides to the corner. Amon, Daniel Schneeman, I think he's gone under the radar for really the majority of this event. He may be our slug champion. Yeah, there's one thing about Stephen Kwan. We've mentioned it so far. He's so methodical. I think he has the best understanding overall, but he is 
he is susceptible to that time pressure. He seems to always be lower on time, and he's down almost a minute here. He, he slides his king to h3. Watch out if you're Daniel Schneeman. That white queen is trying to give endless checks to the black king. Now, the queen, where it currently sits for black, can slide back and block some of the checks, but you might drop pawns in the process. Uh-oh, mm -hmm. he walked right in to the checks that I was talking about. Yeah, now let's see how slippery this king can be because he's definitely going to make his way towards the position and honestly might be smartest for him to just try to go out wow so smart to offer a queen trade what a move and great play from kwan giving a check he's probably gonna pick up this queen side pawn next and oh there goes the camera for schneeman and it's back is that a detroit red wings jersey we see behind him it it is confirmed you know <laughs> it, it's a good thing we have a canadian on the broadcast here just to confirm all the hockey we didn't realize there were gonna be multiple sports in this select champs yeah, where's uh, where's all the hockey uh, players? We'll have to get one of those in the books for a puck champs or something. But that pawn is gone on B6. Amon, not much time left for either player. Who do you favor right now? I think, in general, I've been favoring Quan's opponents in time scrambles, unless Quan is sort of getting like a checkmate going. So I, I think as black, if you're being checked, sometimes it's easier to move because you just you pick up your king and... Put it to the next available square. And both players are on 20 seconds. And oof, now it's wow. white spending time. Look at that block. If the queen trade happened, black's pawn would promote. Man, he's just, he's going all over the place. And now is he going to trade the queens? He's trading them. And then he should so trade up the last pawn. Push your pawn to g4. Or just go after that pawn directly. And the reason why I'm saying that is because if black has zero pieces on the king remaining, white mm -hmm. cannot possibly lose the game. And he goes away from it. Yeah, so he can still lose. And he's down on time right now. I guess he'll secure the draw. No, he's, surely not a draw. A draw. <laughs> yes, look, how, look at how slowly he's moving. I think he's on like some kind of tablet. Can't possibly be a draw. It's checkmate in one! Oh, 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 he, he let him escape! No! <laughs> oh, he pushed the wrong pawn, I'm on. <laughs> he had mate in one. And he's being told about it by the Chess.com game review and certainly by his teammates right now. Oh my goodness. And oh, he had checkmate in one move. He was the one down a couple pawns. And Stephen Kwan, he was making miracles, not on ice, on the chessboard. And yet it didn't come to fruition. He couldn't get the W. Instead, we have a, our first draw, Amon, of this entire slug champs. And would you have ever expected the one draw that we've got so far to come in this way? Like, it's a checkmate in one missed into a flag by 0 0.8 seconds? No, I was too busy thinking about, like, Steve Iserman and Detroit Red Wings players. And I know you're a Canadian. That must make you happy. But this <laughs> game made Stephen Kwan miserable. And that's what chess sometimes does to people. You might love the game, and then you don't win a position where you're about to queen two different pawns. You're like, yep. this is ridiculous. Come on, what is this? <laughs> wow, that was so entertaining to watch. I was actually looking at Bo Naylor in the background there, and he was watching, like, and truly just having a great time, just as a chess fan. He was, like, jumping up and down, at, like, really going along with the eval of the game. That was fun to watch. And as you shout out Bo Naylor, he was in the background. Uh, he gets a victory against Austin Hedges, who didn't show up. But Gab also caught up with Bo and talked to him about how chess helps strategize in baseball as the catcher. Let's hear what Bo had to say. Hey guys, welcome back. We are now with Bo Naylor. Okay, talk us through your first couple of rounds here. You swept Will Brennan. You're not going to let him forget that, right? Oh, of course not. You know, he's going to hear from me, you know, at least once a day, uh, make, make it known uh, that you know, I'm his daddy in chess. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like Austin Hedges will also be saying similar to that. He was sitting next to you. What mm -hmm. was it like with all of his energy? <laughs> just, yeah, a, a lot going on to my left. Um, but, you know, that's him. And, you know, he does that in everything that he does. And it's part of the reason that, you know, he's a, he's a good competitor because he's able to bring that energy in everything that he goes. And he kind of has that little game to him to where he can get in your head that way. And I think that's what he did getting his wins today. It was kind of a roller coaster for you at the end because you you win one game with the 0.6 seconds mm -hmm. team and closed you out. What was that like? I mean, I feel like you know first game got to a good start and then after that I was like hanging on by a thread. So you know for me to be able to get two against him, that's that's a compliment because he's a phenomenal player. But 
yeah, you know, just like some good back and forth, good move, a um, few blunders in between, but uh, no, it was fun. And how long have you been playing chess? How comfortable are you with the game? Honestly, so I've, I feel like I've gotten pretty comfortable, but it's pretty much been a year to around this time when Quan introduced it to me last uh, spring training. So yeah, you know, we're coming around to that time and it's been great um, ever since I've started. We're expecting a lot of leadership from you, especially at the catcher position. You're, you're going to be a leader on the field. What has Austin Hedges offered you, besides all the roasting and, and <laughs> yeah. theatrics today, what has he offered you as a mentor? Um, you know, really just, you know, figuring a way to, you know, lead a team, lead a pitching staff, um, be a great teammate, bring good energy, hold everyone accountable and hold myself accountable at the same time. And, you know, just kind of give me different perspectives and ways to look at the games and you know some of the experience that he has you know I'm, I'm always going to be you know ears open ready to listen to him because he's got a lot to say and he's got a lot of great things to say so he's been he's been great to me so far and you know I'm really grateful to be able to have him as a mentor and someone that I can look to for guidance and as catchers you always are strategizing do you feel like chess can help you in that process yeah for sure uh, I think there's a lot of similarities in this game that can be translated to baseball you know, especially being being the catch. So, you know, you got a game plan for, you know, different strategies as to how you're going to basically get get your opponent, um, ways to move your pieces in chess, certain ways um, when they're doing that, how to combat that in the box. When you see a hitter doing this, being able to combat that and select the right pitch. So I feel like, you know, there, there's a few things that kind of come together that playing this game really – provides without going through the day-to-day -day grind of um, playing baseball. Last thing, you are the third place winner automatically, so you'll be able to donate money to the charity of your choice. Yes. Which one are you choosing? Oh, what was the name Did, of it? No, we Jerry, were going over yeah, right? Was it the APL? It's APL, I yes. I know, because I thought yes. you were doing a Canada team. Or like know, some, or know, not a, like I thought you were doing a Canadian charity, yes, and everyone yes. was like, no, don't give it to both, <laughs> and we, we want it to stay here. Yeah, okay, no, well. it's a Cleveland, um, Cleveland Animal Protective Organization, so you know, me being someone who loves animals, I definitely yes. wanted that to be a focal point um, for me. And yeah, you know, I'm really excited to have been a part of this and, you know, be able to contribute anything that I could. Cool. Well, we appreciate it both. Thanks for your time. And uh, hey, keep practicing. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try my best. Thank Coming you. Coming from you. me, I'm so bad. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Great to hear from Bo Naylor, who's excited about all the new faces in the team in spring training and also is enjoying that Stephen Kwan is teaching everyone chess and how that is helping with leadership. And Stephen Kwan, he is not in the lead in his match as he drew game one against Daniel Schneeman. Meanwhile, Bo Naylor, he's got plenty of time on his hands because Austin Hedges, he's already headed on out. He is done for the day. And so Bo will take third place. Amon, what a bracket we have, and it's still going to be a tight finish. And we also have the consolation bracket where Tristan McKenzie and Will Brennan scored opening game matches or wins, excuse me. Yeah, I think this is the first time that we can actually say that after a game of chess, Stephen Kwan has not been leading <laughs> in his match. So uh, he's, Daniel Schneeman definitely has that under his belt. What a... Uh, what a treat it was to watch that unfold on the camera. But there, as you can see from the bird's eye, are lots of matches still going on here. And of course, Bo Naylor has already locked in his third place. <laughs> he doesn't even have to play and he gets wins. That's probably the best a chess player can experience. And for Stephen Kwan, he just experienced pain. He is in the top left-hand side of our screens. He has the black mm -hmm. pieces and he's on Team Scandi. Yeah, that's... Usually an opening that does take some practice to get right because as we alluded to earlier in the show, bringing your queen out like that is not normally the best advice that I would give to a beginner player. But Stephen Kwan saying, I am no beginner. Uh, he's clearly studied the game of chess. And now we have a Scandinavian. And look at that last move from Daniel Schneeman. I don't think that we should underestimate him in, at all. He is clearly good at chess. He has studied, he is finding tactics. If that knight is captured, it looks like a free piece. Down goes the black queen. Mm -hmm. And that's why Stephen Kwan brought the queen back to c7, which is a great square for that queen. But now black is forced to recapture with a pawn on f6. And pawns get doubled as a result. 
And well, we are going to bring on Gab, who's uh, alongside the players, uh, enjoying their trash talking. And uh, Gab, can you tell us what happened first and foremost with Austin Hedges? Where did he go? What did he say? What's <laughs> going on? It sounds like, as you guys put it earlier, the Miller Lite Gambit got the best of him. Uh, <laughs> I, I imagine he would take a little nap because he few Miller Lights in and, you know, in typical Austin style. He's got his own mind made up about it. I think he put all of his energy out here on the, the digital board, if you will, and he had to go refuel and get catch his nap after all those Miller lights. That's fair. And I think in the background, I feel like I just heard an oh no. As we can see on the chessboard live developing, uh, Daniel Schneeman just blundered his queen away. Most valuable piece on the chessboard, and I think I heard that one in the background there, Gab. <laughs> oh yeah, they've been. I've been hearing a lot of oh no's. Um, I captured Quan. I was just taking a video myself of his. I zoomed in on his face right when he said, "Oh no," he thought that he was gonna lose, and then it was a draw. And it's just crazy the roller coaster of emotions you can see happen on people's faces in in real time, and they're obviously audible about it. You guys can hear, but the the oh no's. And the and the yeah is going around today. And Gab, I mean, he is a leader on the field, is Stephen Kwan, and it seems like he's a leader uh, teaching the rest of the clubhouse chess. Uh, we listened to your interview, and what has that been like hearing from the players about how much chess they're studying, how much they're working on? I mean, what's the the vibe like with them talking about uh, their preparation and how much chess they look at? It's really interesting because when I was able to pre-interview players yesterday about the tournament, I think almost every player said they got an influence from Stephen Kwan, having introduced the game to them in some capacity, whether that was within the past year or even in minor league baseball. Um, so he's definitely had this inside influence on everyone, and it's crazy to see all of this come to fruition because everybody has become interested in this so much so that you know, alluding to what I mentioned earlier, they've been able to partner with the John Marshall high school chess team and get it going even amongst young people in the community. I think that's what's really cool about chess. It's just one of those things. It doesn't matter your age and gender, race, anything. You can sit down and play and learn from people and be competitive, trash talk people like we've heard all afternoon over here, the clap going and everything. So it's definitely been cool that he's had such an influence. And to reiterate what Will Brennan said earlier, if Quan doesn't win this whole thing, he's going to hear about it in the locker room. Yeah, Gab, I was actually going to ask about that because, you know, he has been showing chess to the guys and he kind of created and helped create this event. So, I mean, what kind of animosity is he going to be facing if he can't even uh, clean up the event that he set up for himself here? Yeah, it's funny. He was telling me yesterday he tries not to trash talk too much because of the off chances, because it doesn't happen often, that he loses. But when he loses, it is painful because of the, the chirping that he gets from the rest of the guys. So he was trying to say he, he tries to keep it a little quiet, but even today we've been able, able to hear him be a little bit vocal and, and jawn at people and animate. But it's crazy when he locks in, the look of focus that washes over him and the other players out here. Um, you'd think it was a golf course. It just gets so silent. Everyone is just in the zone. Um, and then after something big happens, you can feel the energy and the reaction. Well, I was going to say, Gab, it might be extra silent because Austin left. He was bringing in the noise. He was bringing the fun. Uh, but now it seems like they point. have quite a bit. <laughs> That's a good uh, point. Without Austin's bellowing voice throughout the building, it is a lot more quiet. <laughs> well, Steven did just win uh, that game, so he now leads by a point. Uh, Gab, uh, we'll let you catch up with everybody on the ground, but we definitely look forward to hearing more from what's happening in Goodyear, Arizona in a little bit. Sounds good. Thanks, Cap. Uh, so fun to hear everything that's happening with the players. And Stephen Kwan, he wins with the black pieces. We heard, I don't know if there was a bleeped out word in there, Amon, but we heard Daniel <laughs> Schneeman uh, just lose it when he dropped his queen. It was an outright blunder. Yeah, it was an outright blunder. And it was actually interesting. Over the course of that check-in with Gab there, the entire game concluded. We, we saw the queen being hung. We saw, we heard the queen being hung. And then after that, we even saw the, uh, the checkmate happen there. So uh, uh, while we didn't 
uh, see the moves on the board. I feel like we pretty much experienced it, Robert, uh, with the audio. We did indeed. And look at this position we've tuned into. There's a huge tactic for Tristan McKenzie. Will he spot it? Now look at pins. Look at king placement. There's a king in the center for white. That knight is hanging. It can be captured. And the queen cannot be taken back because the pawn is pinned. And that's an absolute pin down the D file. So, Aman, it looks like Tristan McKenzie, uh, he has a good chance of getting this match in his favor. He's up one nothing. Ooh, he moves his rook, which is also a perfectly reasonable move, but he missed that kind of knockout blow. Yeah, that would have been a really impressive tactic to see. It's not, uh, not every day you're going to feel confident moving your queen to a square where it normally can be taken by a pawn, but using chess tactics to make sure that can happen. So the move was uh, quite a strong one nonetheless. The knight gets out of there. That's a good response from Tanner Bybee and Amon, something we have to talk about. While Black's queen and bishop, they look menacing in the dark squares, look at Tristan McKenzie's clock. He's down mm -hmm. under a minute. Yeah, and no increment as we keep reminding you guys. Uh, I have to give a shout out to the players, uh, Robert, because I feel like they've handled no increment chess super well i expected way more nonsense and flags to happen and even when we have seen someone lose on time it hasn't been too too crazy so i feel like the overall quality of the slug champs event especially if we're comparing it to some of the other um you know major sports uh chess events that have been hosted here on chess.com i mean the quality feels pretty Woo! damn high here and just as you said that he spotted the second time he sacrifices in quotes his queen that is not legal pawn takes queen if Amon tries it it won't let it happen because it's pinned to the king so that is why tristan mckenzie just grabbed a piece but now i look again his oh. time oh oh <laughs> you know what's insane and why you it doesn't even feel like this was a mistake is black's position is so good <laughs> that the engine is like yeah no problem we didn't even need the queen <laughs> yeah who needs that and now black needs to be quick because uh it's not just the clock that's a problem it's the board white has a queen black has a rook a knight and a couple pawns love that move rook h1 yeah. going for the attack yeah and don't forget about the queen covering that bishop backwards the king actually needs to get out of the way here it's always really easy to play with a queen and with 20 seconds tristan mckenzie is really up against it here I like the way both players have handled the last couple moves, but look uh -oh. at the clock. Oh, pushing the G-pawn. It's a bit slow, but Amon, the clock, that's the biggest yep. problem for Tristan. Yeah, I wonder if he knows how to pre-move here. He's looking, I uh, have to say, very relaxed on cam there for <laughs> a guy with 17 seconds. He's used to being in the spotlight with a lot of pressure on his shoulders. Oh, that rook is hanging. He could have taken it. Instead, he pushes his E-pawn. Hard to uh, fault that move too much. But mm -hmm. he's got 13 seconds, and he needs to find a way forward. But I think he almost did kind of pre-move E3, so that gives me some hope knowing that he knows how to do those moves. And look at Tanner Bybee. He recognized he lost his bishop. It wasn't captured. The clock is evening up quite a bit. Tanner is moving very methodically, let's call yep. it. And I think that suddenly Tristan might be the favorite. Yep. He definitely knows what he's doing here. It's not about the quality of the moves at this point. You just need a move. There you go. Oh, that's enough. That's a, that's a cool move. He's picking up the rook. That's a really good move. <laughs> but he's going to flag. I, I just don't think he's getting this off in time. I thought maybe he would go up, and he does get the win on time. <laughs> uh, look at Tanner Bybee and these players. They're doing a uh, handshake from afar, and Tanner's laughing. But whew, that was a close one. That really was. Yeah, he barely got the win there. And... Uh... <laughs> he got he got the win after honestly one of the more impressive moves in the entire competition. I think back to that queen takes e5 move and credit where credit's due. That was slick. That was a really slick finish there. It is as we see in the champions bracket one and a half half in favor of Stephen Kwan. Now the third place match it never got off the ground. Never was played as Bo Naylor is our third place finisher. And then in the consolation bracket, uh, we still have an up for grabs final as Tristan McKenzie and Tanner Bybee have split their first two games. Meanwhile, Will Brennan, he's getting on the scoreboard and it's David Fry, the, the newbie, the last 
minute replacement as there was a late scratch he has yet to score a point yeah it's you know and i definitely want him to get on the board of course uh, at the end of the day, chess is, uh, it can be brutal, it can be unforgiving, but certainly entertaining as we <laughs> look back on these incredible moments from today. I, <laughs> I don't even know which one's my favorite, but <laughs> yeah, the virtual handshake there. <laughs> I was surprised to see my own reaction on the screen, but that's because so much happened in such a short period of time. And Stephen yeah, Kwan- I actually thought that that was you reacting to what I was saying. I was like, whoa, okay. It's not that crazy. <laughs> hey, Amon, you know I appreciate your words. Sometimes I have to get all excited and just react accordingly. Uh, but uh, we might have our last games of Slug Champs. I know that Tanner Bybee and Tristan McKenzie, that will have to go the distance into a fourth game. But in the top left, Stephen Kwan, he could end this thing with the white pieces against Daniel Schneeman. Yeah, so he's going to have white here, and I'm wondering if we're going to see the patented, you know, just e4, knight f3, d4, right? This has been uh, his go-to thus far, and it, I feel like Stephen Kwan with the white pieces has been really, really hard to stop. I feel like he is showing his prowess. We saw some great preparation for Stephen Kwan, you know, with the, from the black side in the previous match, and we are going to start with the consolation uh, games. So let's go into the one between Tristan McKenzie with white and Tanner Bybee with black. I feel like we can uh, just quickly dive in and see what's going on there as some trades have been offered. Both players have a solid start to this third game. Yeah, let's let's check in with this one and definitely make sure to jump over to uh, Will and, and David there because, you know, secretly I, I'm just I'm rooting for uh, David Fry to get his first win in in the event so we'll start with this one here between um tristan and tanner and i think the reason that that evaluation bar is creeping up there might have something to do with the pressure that white can create on c7 here but this is a good move too love that giving a check and the knight goes back i like your idea i'm on right now knight to b5 is having also knight e5 Piling pressure on a pin piece. Uh, ooh, I, I don't mind that move either. I think that for a newer player, that's a very good attempt going right after the undefended queen side. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Man, it's almost like he didn't expect B6 at all, so he was just continuing with whatever he was going to do anyway. Ooh. So that uh, was a hanging piece. I think Tristan just noticed it. Did you see that, Amon, where he's like, oh, he kind of jumped in his chair a little bit. But that yeah. knight on c6, it's vulnerable. Indeed. Yeah, that was a big moment there in, in that one. And uh, speaking of big moments, we also have the games underway in the finals, Stephen Kwan and Daniel Schneeman. So why don't we tune into that as it is for the grand prize. and. Well, we have teammates always lurking, people watching behind the players. And in this position, hey, things are locked up. Amon, this is a high-quality start to this game from Daniel Schneeman with the black pieces. And if I'm not mistaken, there's a pawn that's hanging in the center of the board. Yeah, Bishop takes on F3. And honestly, I, I really like uh, Steven's position. And I feel like because of the player that Steven is... He's going to excel in a position where it's like a safe, stable advantage. And this was Daniel's decision, Schneeman. He decided to give his bishop up for a knight and then push his pawn to dark squares. So uh, that bishop on f3, if it reroutes itself, speaking of rerouting, I love that move, knight to d7. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's actually pawn on b3. Nice idea. Maybe he wants to develop the bishop, but it actually should be on b4 to take that square away from the knight. So I wonder if he's going to move the queen and realize how strong the knight is and look to kick it out. He moves back. Step one, su successful. Now he's to push the pawn next. Now is the time. It is a bit risky because if you ever push that b3 pawn up, it gives away some squares. So I understand his you know, reservations before doing that. Uh, but at some point, the sides will have to come up with a concrete plan. For now, they're shuffling pieces. Yeah, and you know, a nice piece of advice that is kind of easy to follow at its core is if you have a bishop, try to avoid putting all your pawns on the exact same color as that bishop because 
look, there's just nowhere that it can go in Black's position. Doesn't have a lot of open diagonals. And that's where bishops excel. And that light square bishop for white, the only one on the board, it can step forward one square there. Wow. Great move, hitting the queen, but also trying to jump into e6 with check. Uh, a rook can land on c8. That would be saucy. Ooh. Yeah, rook c8 is a great move because it would actually maybe encourage queen f7, losing the queen. And, oh, he kind of, like, picked which piece he wanted to defend and left one hanging in the process. But you can see Schneeman, you know, he recognized that he blundered uh, that bishop. And with that gone, the strength of Stephen Kwan is uh, being felt. However... Quan did lose a game against Hedges when he was up. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, he was the one down some material, but first uh, he had a good position. So it's shown that you can't come back against him if he's not on his A game. Yep, and knight c5 played. I mean, nothing changed. That knight's still a strong piece. The only thing is black's down a bishop now. Knight takes e4, though, is a threat. If you're not thinking, maybe just one track mine, kick out the knight, you could drop this pawn and maybe make your life a little bit harder. Slide the king to the corner. Don't trade when you're behind if you're Daniel Schneeman. So just bring mm -hmm. the king on over. Don't give up your really good knight. Great decision from him. And that rook on e7, it doesn't have many squares to work with. There could be a future where it gets trapped. But look at Stephen Kwan go. He decides to kick that knight out of there. Trades favor him. Yeah, really smart decision to play b4 there. Honestly, this looks really tough for Daniel because he's doing exactly what you told him not to do. Trading when you're down material. Unfortunate for him, but he was in for a tough one as Stephen Kwan has been playing excellent chess throughout this whole day. And now we are nearing the end of Slug Champs Amon. It looks like Stephen Kwan, he organized this event. He's been inspiring yep. his teammates to play chess. I think he did it so he could be the first Slug Champ winner. <laughs> I think so. And honestly, uh, we heard from Gab earlier how much of the, the chirps that would be waiting for him if he could not win the event that he kind of made happen. Uh, I think, honestly, for the sake of the locker room, this is the right result. <laughs> and, you know, for the sake of considering the strength of the players, I do think that this ultimately is the right result. Checkmate in one. The queen is dropped, but that doesn't matter. Stephen Kwan is your winner of Slug Champs. He earned it. Yeah, he really did. That was a really impressive performance by Schneeman. I think he wasn't on everyone's radar from the beginning of the event and to show up in the finals draw in the first game he was a very formidable opponent for steven but ultimately steven kwan deserved winner robert i think he played overall the best chess today that that i saw you could to say that for sure, and for Stephen Kwan, he's got two gold glove awards, but you push those aside in the trophy case. You are now the <laughs> winner of the first Slug Champs, and you see the players they are talking to each other. Mon, I, I am always happy to see teammates who love a game that's not their professional sport. Uh, they're just uh, probably chirping a little bit, but also enjoying the atmosphere. Good. And, you know, I have the most exciting news, you know, even more than the winner of the event. Uh, we have a camera for Will Brennan. <laughs> wow that uh that's been a long time coming so i don't know what's been going on with his laptop i don't know if the team has you know, doesn't provide him with great resources wait, wait a second where's his queen yeah i'm telling you we're seeing a couple first uh, times maybe david fry getting his first win will brennan on can i mean yeah some people have stuck around in the show just for this moment right here oh queen takes bishop that he walked into a checkmate did Will Brennan because that bishop and queen line up on the light squares and there's nothing that can be done. Look at David Fry. I think wow. he doesn't trust himself completely the way he was a bit hesitant to take the bishop, but he's showing that he can hang with his teammates and a little bit more practice. And I think that uh, he's a much better result in future Slug Champs events. Yeah, that bishop, it does control all the way down the diagonal, but certainly tough to see. So even though he had checkmate there he decided to go after the material because you know that's only a couple squares away easier to see we'll see if he can coordinate a checkmate here because otherwise i'm worried david fry is going to lose on time robert yeah i'm looking at that 32 seconds for him with the black pieces but white only at 45 seconds and a teammate and friend behind him distracting him like you know, <laughs> that's not going to help you move quickly yeah i'm trying to think Are these guys really playing on the same team here <laughs> oh, what a move! That's, that was the way. That 
that was the best move of the entire event? Oh no! Oh my no! That was the best move. That was literally. I didn't even see it. I'll be so honest. I didn't even consider it. That was incredible. That, that was, was the puzzle actual rush best tactic. move. That was. That, I can't believe what we just saw. No, but he's rated a hundred, and he just easily move of the event. Easily. But let's show that again to give the fans a treat. That was an unbelievable tactic. Incredible. Rook to E3, and in this position, like the, the best engine move, like engine approved, Rook <laughs> takes H2. Your queen's attack, you could even call it kind of a fork here. A lot of us would play queen F5 in a heartbeat, myself included. But no, Rook takes H2. Robert, the idea, you lose your queen, you should get checkmate. He played bishop E2, he didn't see the follow-up. He didn't know his own genius. Oh my god. I mean, brilliance is often not understood in that time, right? Contemporaries, they don't quite get it. But David Fry was cooking. Look at that queen H1. That's what I was saying. He just doesn't have enough experience to put it all yep. together. But that was a brilliant shot. It was actually incredible. <laughs> and I feel like you might even think right now that we're just like, oh yeah, man, like he had the best move. Like that was incredible. Like I'm so serious. That was the best move in the position. And I, none of us saw it. David Fry may have zeros throughout the entire day on the scoreboard. You see him on the bottom right hand side of this graphic, but he just won the hearts of many. What a tactic that was, but hearts, you know, that's not what they came to win. They came to win chess games, and that's what Stephen Kwan came and succeeded in doing. He ends up as our winner in Slow Champs. He beats Daniel Schiemann, a runner up two and a half half. Amon, what a match, what an event, what a final game we saw. Yeah, that was really incredible. Um, you know, Stephen Kwan taking the win. Huge congratulations. He is our Slug Champs winner, and I believe that. Uh, I was going to say, oh, you know, he did it without losing a single game, but uh, 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 he did lose once to Austin Hedges. And I feel like Steven, despite winning the entire event, I feel like all the guys are going to be talking about, especially Austin, maybe for the next year until the next Slug Champs, is that win. And because of what we just saw, I almost forgot, we still have a game to go. Tristan McKenzie up 2-1 to one over Tanner Bybee. There is more chess, but before we dive into that fourth game of their match, let's revisit some of the reactions of this previous round. There's Gab in the back as well. It's hard to tell <laughs> if that was like right after a blunder or 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 not. Oh, there's you! <laughs> Oh, I was in pain. And look at you. We both had a similar reaction. That was such a good move. It was so good. <laughs> oh, and we Shout finally out to Will had... Brennan. I was about to say, for the first time, we got to see his face. You know, he uh, went completely under the radar because his laptop camera didn't work or something like that. But he wins that match. But David Fry, Rook takes H2. Oh, Unbelievable. Man. That's something. And, you know, this almost kind of feels like another final just because it's the only match ongoing. And even though it's not the overall final, this is the first time where, you know, Stephen Kwan is actually going to be in the background, maybe of these guys cams watching them duke it out. Yeah, it's one of those situations where you still want to win, even though it may not be for first overall place. Let's face it, the winner of this match has won two matches and only lost their opening round matchup where they were outrated by quite a heavy margin. So we see Bishop B5 on move two. Tristan McKenzie has yet to respond. Uh, he is playing at a deliberate pace, one might say. Yeah, and you know, he slowed down, but he's actually completely winning if he had played B5 and C4. We've seen that theme of trapping the Bishop before. Oh, and we see instead development, so we can't really blame the players too much. These are strong moves. And for Tristan McKenzie, he almost looks bored, right? He's got his uh, head on his hand. He's leaning to the side. And for Tanner Bybee, you see him. He's trying to figure out the tactics here. 
Get your king out of the center. That would be my no, – no, see, he's, there's no attack. and This is not the first time we've seen this today. Yeah, these pieces do not coordinate very well. The bishop would already need to be on b3. But, hey, one piece of advice for these players, uh, go full uh, Ben Feingold on them, Robert. Never play f6. I feel like that would serve them well. But, man, right here, it's actually baited him in. And Tanner, he's giving it away. Oh, oh no! Man. I think Tanner was biting the green pawn, and Tristan trusted his team in. He's, and now he's like, uh-oh, that was he's a like, hanging piece. <laughs> Can I have just taken that? Absolutely, yes, you could have. So I take it back, Amon. Knight to g5 was the best move in the position because it uh, you know, was a series of forced decisions that led us here, and White is doing very well. Yeah, it, the, it's funny that the resulting position is... Honestly, like a position I could see in some kind of world championship match, like, you know, oh, just you know, maybe slight edge for white G3, like brilliant move here. <laughs> this is a good lesson that a pawn three squares away from a knight dominates that knight. So the knight had some intentions to hop forward, not anymore. And yeah, the, the matchup you're talking about, Magnus Carlsen, Fabiano Caruana in their uh, 2018 match, this does look like that type of opening. Uh, credit to these guys in a, what could be our final game here, showing up big time. I'm loving what Tristan has done in the center here. Whether he takes or pushes, and he makes the right decision, in my opinion, I would be looking for him to set up what I'm going to coin the uh, David Fry. That's what I was going to say. We are completely <laughs> on the same page. I'm a, a little disappointed that you got there first. But, yeah, this is uh, the Fry attack. Oh! <laughs> No, hang on, he's gonna fry him. Just wait for it. <laughs> it should be wait, seven. How, how is this even? <laughs> he just lost. Yeah, a rook. actually, what? <laughs> they just lost an entire rook, and that's, I guess, how good Black's position is with the attack. But no, he went the wrong direction. He needed to go to b seven to keep the queen trapped in there. Now the queen should slide all the way back to f three, and there Fantastic. it goes. Tanner Bybee, he's in charge. Yep. And I'm trying to remember in in this match here, it is is it two one for Tristan? So yes, Tanner right. needs the win, and I mean needing the win and being up now a rook and a bishop, uh, he's in great shape. He wants that extra time, and he is now up a ton of material. So uh, for Tristan, he blundered a rook in a corner, but. Tanner, he was creating some threats that were not spotted by his opponent. And I don't really see how Black can create chances. The White King is safe and sound. Black doesn't have too many pieces remaining. And he's just pushing pawns at this stage. Yeah, and strangely enough, like, Tanner's position would be a lot harder to manage if that pawn just wasn't on G3. You know, there might be back rank issues. The knight could slide into F4 or H4. So that move so long ago from tanner that you and i were saying wow that's a great move it's actually really paying dividends here and you're starting to see why it's a nice play look at that his knight was in the rim now it uh, hops into the action it also cuts that black rook off from getting back and defending i do mm -hmm. like tristan's response queen to b7 just trying to eye that long diagonal but so far tanner has nothing to worry about he's actually creating checkmating threats of his own yeah knight here and you have to think that Kind of going to go aggressive or at least move somewhere where he attacks some pieces. Look at that. Double attack, but it could backfire. Oh, he found it. And he's like pounding his chest a little bit, Matthew McConaughey style. <laughs> yeah, I'm wondering which way the king's going to go because conventionally, I think the guys kind of don't want to go in the, in the corner because they'll just get checked down here. There it is. Look at Tanner Bybee. I mean, what a Dang. game he just played here. Dang, Tanner. He that even up this beautiful. match. Yeah, and that just made it a tie match. And do these players recognize that they might have another game to play? Yeah, I, I feel like, so right now it's two to two. And I'm wondering if maybe one of them thought that it was over or something. Like, it seemed like Tristan kind of got up like, all right, you got me. It's like, no, no, it's tied. <laughs> uh, yeah, that is a tied match 2-2, two to two. and for Tristan, he hung his rook and couldn't hang in after that. And we see the scoreboard, Steven Kwan, he is our champion. Daniel Schneeman, deserved second place, runner-up. Bo Naylor, 
got third as Austin Hedges didn't even bother showing up to the third place matchup. And in the Constellation Finals, it is 2-2. Two to two. Tristan McKenzie, Tanner Bybee, nothing separating them. While Will Brennan, David Fry, David Fry is a hero. He may have finished in the bottom of the standings, but Rook takes H2. That's the move of the day. Yep, still thinking about it. He definitely gets the fan vote uh, in that one. So, so many different things to celebrate in, in this event and reflect on. And we're not even done. We don't even have a, a, a winner in, in that other matchup between Tristan and Tanner. No, the action continues in slow champs as it's a 2-2 tie in the consolation bracket finals. But the reactions have been awesome from the venue. Uh, the players, they're giving it their all, but they're also talking some trash and sharing some laughs. And I think we are... I don't know what's happening, Amon. Like, are we waiting for the next game to begin? Do the players even know they have a next game? <laughs> I actually, I'm not sure. I, <laughs> I swear I looked on the camera and I saw Tristan's reaction to that game and it looked like how you'd react if you just lost the whole match. So I'm wondering, if, did he forget <laughs> that? He, no, you actually had two points in that match. <laughs> like, you were, you were winning. So I hope maybe. he realizes that, you know, maybe he doesn't pull an Austin Hedges and head out of the building. Okay, well, our minds are clearly uh, on the same page. I would say he might have received a text from Austin, being like, come on, man, we got better things to do. Like, uh, come join me for the party. But uh, there is no partying yet for Tristan McKenzie because he's still in that match against Tanner Bybee. It's been so fun thus far, Amon. I'm just you know, almost excited to know what happens next. But we saw Steven Kwan. He's the champion. He gets the last laugh. Oh, that was a good one. That was a good one. <laughs> I love the disintegration from Robert, and then the it's almost like you're revealing the, the pink <laughs> throne behind you. Oh, well, Will Brandon finally got a technological breakthrough. We saw his face, and it was a happy one. Tanner Bybee still going at it. He's trying to call it done, but it's not done here. We're going to head to break, but when we return, it's the consolation bracket finals between Tristan McKenzie and Tanner Bybee. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back in Slug Champs. Do you wish playing a chess game with a friend was as easy as sending them a text? Well, good news. Now it is. With chess.com's new iMessage app, you can start and play a game directly in iMessage. Your friend doesn't even need a chess.com account. It's just tap and play. Head over to go.chess.com slash iMessage or use the command iMessage in chat to learn more. The Chess World Championship has been a prestigious title for well over a hundred years, but oftentimes the prize money was lackluster. Chess in the 19th century developed without an international governing body. World Championships were negotiated between players with challengers expected to raise large enough stakes to entice a title holder to compete. The first official World Championship in 1886 had a substantial prize purse, fitting for an inaugural event. Subsequent championships failed to generate substantial purses. It would take 35 years for the World Championship's prize purse to surpass the amount raised for the first championship. Something magical happened in chess. A new challenger from the United States pierced the Iron Curtain and threatened to end Soviet dominance of the sport. Bobby Fischer won the candidates matches in 1971, earning him the right to play Spassky for the world title. Fisher was different than other players of the time. He didn't just want to be the best player, or the most dominant, or even the most famous. He wanted to be paid. Fisher grew up in abject poverty in Brooklyn, New York, and was highly motivated by money and earning what he believed chess players were worth. The storylines were interesting and diverse. USA versus the USSR. West versus East? Capitalism? versus communism. The world was ready to see these two superpowers battle it out on the chess table. Fisher's demands continued to impact almost every variable of the event, including the location, the chessboard and pieces, and of course, the prize purse. 
Fisher even had the audacity to demand a share of the ticket sales and broadcast royalties for the players. At one point, it looked like the event might not even happen. Fisher claimed the prize money was too low, despite it already being the highest in history. Fisher's calculated moves paid off when a wealthy business owner doubled the prize purse, raising it to $250,000 or $1.7 million today. Fisher and Spassky shared a prize purse bigger than all the previous world championship prizes combined. After their match, Boris Spassky stated to the press how grateful he was for Bobby Fischer and how the money from this event was going to change his life. Bobby Fischer single-handedly raised the profile and catapulted chess into a mainstream sport followed by millions of people. Fischer had ensured that not only he and Spassky, but every world championship competitor after them earned a deserving prize. Everyone loves playing chess, and everyone loves chess club. But there's also a time and a place for playing all your favorite games. Hey, we're trying to have a lesson here. You need to get out of here. Recently, more kids have been playing chess than ever in school. But sadly, we've learned that they may not always be playing chess at the most appropriate time. Eh ben, class, aujourd'hui... While it might be sometimes okay to grab a game between classes, or if your teacher gives you permission and hasn't given you an assignment, it's not okay to be playing chess in school when you aren't supposed to. And chess should never come between you taking your studies seriously and cooperating with your fellow students and teachers. Chess over the board or on the phone is a great way to spend time with friends. But let's make sure that this school year, we don't let too much chess happen in the classroom. Focus on your school, because chess.com will always be there when class is over. Chess is school. Respect your school. All right, that was awesome, everybody. Great job. Look what I did. Danny, did you spell that? Yeah. Can we get some other letters, please? What's wrong with it? We return to Slug Champs. We know our winner is Stephen Kwan. So the first place prize of $6,000 will be going to the Cleveland Metropolitan School District Chess Clubs. It's great to see uh, these athletes support their causes and their local communities as Stephen Kwan wins the champions bracket two and a half half over Daniel Schneeman. In the third place match, Bo Naylor, he didn't even have an opponent as Austin Hedges. Well, he had better things to do. He had better people to see. And so he left the chessboard and left Bo Naylor in third place. But without further ado, it's an absolute honor. It's a privilege, a treat to be joined by your slug, slug champs winner, Stephen Kwan. Stephen, how are you feeling right now? What was that experience like for you? I'm relieved. I think I'm definitely relieved. That was a very tense, stressful time, uh, especially with all the, the noise going around. Uh, definitely a different experience from being in the box, but that was, that was a lot of fun. If you didn't win this, you realize all of the trip that you would have endured, right? Yes, I, I detached from this before we started. I was ready to lose. I was I was hearing the the chirping. I was I was ready for it. So I'm again relieved that we could we could finish it out. How do you compare your nerves for a baseball game versus what transpired today? I feel like with baseball, I can I feel better with it because you know I've done the work. I've trained with chess. I mean, it's so much fun, but I'm so bad at the same time. Like anything can happen. I do not feel the same kind of preparedness. Um, Definitely more stressful playing chess. Let's talk about your originations with chess, because I know you talked about yesterday your dad got you into it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, how did you become so hooked? Yeah. Um, so at first, yeah, I played with my dad. Uh, he beat me a bunch of times. He didn't let me win like a, like a good dad. I'm, <laughs> I'm just kidding, dad, if you're watching. Um, but I was always kind of in my head. And then three spring trainings ago, me and uh, my teammate, Will Benson, um, instead of like playing video games or just like vegging out on our phones, he asked if I wanted to play chess one day. And, I think I got him the first game, he got me the second game, and then the competitive juices start flowing. We're YouTubing videos, 
or like filming some of our games. It was, it just became a full addiction. It's crazy how it's infiltrated everybody here. So how many players do you think um, have dabbled now in chess? I mean, probably close to like 20, 30 guys in there. I mean, even guys that haven't really played, I think it, it's brave to try and go and play out there because especially people are going to talk smack in there. Uh, but yeah, I think this year we've gotten around 20, 25 guys playing. What were your hardest hurdles today? <sighs> After the Hedges game that I lost. <laughs> um, I think if losing that first one was bad, but losing that second one would have been even worse. So just being able to bounce back from that was, uh, was affirming for sure. Um, yeah, that was... <laughs> That was tough. I'll remember that one for a while. Cool. Well, you know, you're such a leader on the team and one of our most consistent players offensively. He's also placed some mean defense, two gold gloves for you. What are you looking forward to about this season? Just getting back to it. I think we got a new, we got a new coaching staff that looks really promising. Um, I think a lot of our guys took the offseason really seriously. Um, I think we're going to be, I think we're going to be nasty this year. I think we got a lot of, a lot of potential coming up and, you know, maybe people don't agree with that, but we'll, we'll, we're excited to see where it can go. Great. Let's see. You guys have any questions for Steven? Yeah, absolutely. It's great to uh, great to hear from you there, uh, Stephen. I wanted to ask you a few uh, maybe more chess questions. It's nice to hear uh, the baseball, but man, Robert and I, uh, we've seen some things in the opening. We were really impressed by something you brought out, which was, if you can remember it, you sacked a bishop yep. on B4 and then mm -hmm. you hit him with on takes on F2 check. You're not in your head. Do you know which one I'm talking about there? Because yeah, that yeah. looked like great preparation from you. Yeah, actually, the I got a TikTok or YouTube sent to me where if he doesn't take with the king and he goes forward, I would mm -hmm. take the knight and then promote to a knight for check. Yep. And then I would pin it with the bishop and do the same thing. So I was kind of like egging him on to do that. I think that's like one of the coolest lines I've ever seen. And I don't, I can't remember lines very well, but that was one that stuck in my head. So. Um, I've I've shown that one just just for fun, but to be able to do that like on a stream was was really cool. Yeah, that was super impressive, Steven. And I guess on the flip side of that success, you lost that one game on time, or so you thought, but it was actually a draw. What was going through your mind? And we watched your reaction, but like what was that like for you not quite getting the finishing touches to promote your pawns? I was happy because I was just trying to do a draw by repetition. Um I was just trying to get my queen, go back and forth and Maybe he didn't realize he did it once or twice. And then every time he kept blocking, I was like, oh, there's a pawn here, like still going for the draw. And then check again, and oh, there's a pawn there. And I just kept gobbling them until there was none left. And I was like, oh my gosh, I got a, I got a chance to win this. Um, it, it was a roller coaster of emotions, obviously, because now I think I can win it. And then I don't even think about the time. And I, I got to promote my, uh, my pawn. And, but then to click the queen, I think killed that like half a second that I needed. If I had the uh, auto promote, mm -hmm. I think I could have got it there, but just didn't think that far ahead. <laughs> well, that's what chess is all about, you know, having that, having that foresight, something to work on. Your chess was really impressive today, just on a more macro uh, level, Stephen. What does it mean to see an event that you kind of helped set up and, you know, chess, which you've obviously shown to a lot of guys in the clubhouse there, what does it mean to see it just finally happen? And then what did you think of the event overall? Yeah, it's super surreal. I mean, like I said, we all played chess on our phones with chess.com and then to hear that it was getting sponsored like from you guys. I mean, that was super affirming, really cool. Um, just to see the support that came out. I, I didn't really know what to expect. And I don't know what number I saw, but I like, I was like, I peeked on the Twitch chat and I was like, oh, there's like 15 people watching. And then someone was like, that's, I don't even know what number I was watching. There's like 3000 people watching. And then yeah. I think when I told everybody, it was like, oh God, like we kind of tensed up and trying to like stare at the screen a little harder. Um, it was a really cool experience for sure. Yeah, thanks for letting me know everyone was roasting me in the oh chat over the audio. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. You <laughs> I mean, we're all kind of crazy, which is weird, but I think. I came out, I'm like, wow, Tanner Vibe had so many awesome things this day. And you're just like, hey, just so you know, you're getting cooked in the chat. Yeah, someone was like, the first phone had better reception than that. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> Well, you know, we don't like to see anyone get roasted except when, you know, the players are doing one another. In fact, uh, Stephen, someone joined us for the show, your buddy Akshar, telling us about your head-to-head -head history. He said that, you know, he tries to keep himself humble, but then you've sort of forced him to trash talk. What's uh, that like uh, interacting with the John Marshall High School and Coach Cutler and all the uh, students there? Yeah, it's awesome. I mean, just getting to connect with him the first time was, was really cool. It was cool to be kind of on a level playing field and I think they were a little nervous once we met for the first time, but once we started playing chess, I mean, they are savages. It's unbelievable. Just seeing like a higher level. Like I understand there's levels to this chess stuff, but he is miles ahead and 
he was like he was just trying to be super nice and he was like oh like don't do that move and i'm like oh i thought it was a good movie he's like no it's checkmate next move i'm like oh okay well like he's 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 a great teacher he was super patient which i appreciate but like i don't know if he told you the record but like not being dramatic i think it's like owen 25 it's it, <laughs> i told him i needed a break and i'll rematch him and i had zero intention of rematching it was it was brutal yeah i actually won't repeat the record on air again but we did coax it out of him um and cool. and yeah safe to say it's it's not as bad as that number but it's it's up there he's got a few wins on you yeah he's he's got some over the boards too which that's it hurts definitely hurts but it was cool seeing him for sure i i was also wondering steven uh uh this is going to be cliche and it really can't compare, but man, you did look a little bit nervous out there. In fact, all the guys did. How did it feel playing chess with, you know, you know, everyone's watching. It's a, you know, not fully competitive, but slightly competitive event. There's stuff on the line. Uh, how were the nerves? Oh, no, they were through the roof. Um, I don't know if you guys know this, but the, today was actually our first day of official camp. So we had our team meetings and everything. And I woke up today saying today's the chess turn. Not, not today's the first day. <laughs> Um, it was definitely nerve wracking. Like I was, like I was telling Gab, like baseball, you know, I've done it my whole life. I feel prepared, whatever happens, happens. But I mean, chess is a, it's a wild game. Anything can happen. You take two moves off and you're miles behind and person's talking smack. It's, it's a beautiful game, obviously, but gosh, it's, it's such a wild card. What were you there. saying about delay your demise? I know that I just started playing chess, you guys, so I'm not the biggest expert, but I was picking your brain and something about the time constraints. Hmm enter the picture when it comes to just like delaying your demise mm -hmm. yeah no uh, i did it against tristan uh, i think i was losing but he had less time than i did so i think just play a solid game you guys know it's just a little dirty flag um mm -hmm. i'm not too i'm not too shameless to admit it i had to do it against him but i was delaying my demise but hopefully uh he ran out of time and thankfully he did <laughs> well, one last question from me, uh, Stephen. You know, I hate to bring up this bad memory, but you did lose to Austin Hedges while he was enjoying himself some Miller Lite. So, what's a worst experience for you? Losing that game of chess or dropping like a pop fly that you should catch uh, in your sleep? Oh, no, no. Oh, losing. He wouldn't do that, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> losing, losing for sure. I think it would have been better if he was like down on the table a little bit, but the fact that he was like directly to my right while we were playing <laughs> made it. He was right. He was worse. like, Sun. <laughs> yeah, sunned me a couple times. There's, a, I think there's a picture that got screenshot. I have like my hands in my in my face, and he's literally just like alpha staring at me. I know that one's gonna rotate a little bit, but uh, I I would pray I'd never lose. Him, ever. <laughs> <laughs> well, a good a good way of doing that is never playing him again. But uh, you know, in all seriousness, Stephen, it was awesome to watch you bring your talents to the chessboard. Gab, it's been so awesome having you on site to get the most out of the players' reactions and thoughts. So we appreciate both you. Congrats again, Steven. Well, I mean, seriously, you impress us on. with your chess. I guess I do have a question. I have a chess question. If you guys had to say one thing I got to work on, like a glaring weakness, what are, what are, we, what are we attacking? Amon, you go first. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is easy. I feel like we have the same one. So <laughs> I, I was watching your, your chess. Obviously, we were tuned into a lot of your matches. Mm -hmm. And what kept happening uh, in a number of the games, even though you were uh, you know, miles ahead of some players in terms of understanding, it was the time management. So yeah. you were constantly lower on time than the opponents. And some guys were able to squeak out wins. Uh, some guys named Austin Hedges were able to get some <laughs> positions against you that, uh, you know, they, they might not have gotten if you had more time on the clock. So it felt like you getting low on time was leading to a lot of your mistakes. So it sounds mm -hmm. obvious, like, oh, just play faster. But mm -hmm. it really did feel like that was the, the one thing that stood out to me was your understanding is actually probably better than your rating right now. But because you're letting your time get low, you're putting yourself in a tough spot to make those critical moves. Okay, I appreciate that. Yeah, and I think that you played a really nice event. There are a couple moments I would say that if you rewatch the tape, you're like, well, how did I not make that move? Because you are a strong player. And there are moments where Amon even said that he felt like you were almost too strong for your own good because you saw your opponent's ideas and then you sort of saw ghosts along the way uh, that you, you could have uh, used to your advantage. So you really impressed us. I'm not saying that as a joke from the start, we were uh, praising your play and we hope you continue and just keep crushing it, honestly. Well, I appreciate it. This, yeah, this was a ton of fun. I appreciate the, uh, the honesty on that. I'm, I'm going to keep grinding, but thank you guys for the time. Thanks a lot, uh, Thank Steven. you. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Gab, as well. Yeah, congrats, and thanks both of you, and enjoy your time in uh, Arizona. Spring training is just beginning, and you're now a champion, so celebrate and get back to the diamond. <laughs> yeah, will do. Thanks, guys. <laughs>
Cheers. <laughs> Appreciate you all. Thanks, Gab. Thanks, Stephen. Wow, that was really fun. Amon, I mean, it's great to just enjoy the chess, see athletes taking part in something that, you know, they're not doing every day, especially not mm-hmm. in front of so many people, and see them do it with grace. So, uh, so much can be said about slug champs, but I really felt like the level of play was great. Uh, everybody was quite humble and they gave it their all and loved every bit of it along the way. Yeah, they they really did. And w- nice of Steven to just give us so much of his time at the end of the event. Uh, you know, another shout out to Gab, who's giving all the updates. Like, I think that type of behind the scenes made the event so much more entertaining, at least from a commentary perspective. So hopefully the people appreciated it as fans out there watching. But yeah, just get those up close personal thoughts. You know, serious about the chess. I love the chess questions from Steven. Like, you know, he's grinding. You, he's actually remembering the TikTok that he saw about chess. But then on the flip side, you got Austin Hedges pounding Miller Lights and just having a great time. So the duality, the whole event was tons of fun. Also very competitive and uh, for a good cause as well. So it feels like that's exactly what the event was drawn up to be. Um, so what more can you say? Very little. Money earned for charity is always great. Seeing these players give it their all and come up with some fantastic ideas. I want to shout out David Fry one more time. I know you didn't win any of your games, but Rook Takes H2 was brilliant. And Stephen Kwan, the deserved champion. And I have to say, again, the love that he's asking questions, right? Sometimes when you win, you just say, yeah, all right, I'm the best. I'm awesome. I did that. And you don't actually try to learn from the games and from the different situations. So for Stephen to to come on on the show in front of so many people and ask us for tips to improve. I, I don't know about you, but that uh, was awesome for me to hear. And it's, you know, someone and I'd love to see keep improving at chess. Yeah, like that right there is how you just know that he was kind of the, the mastermind behind setting an event like this. I think he was the one that was bringing chess to the other guys and, and getting everyone involved. That's the type of passion right there. It's not just about winning. He genuinely was curious, like, how can I get better? Because he will still be playing chess from here on out. It wasn't just like he started playing a bunch of games just for this event. No, he's, he's always been grinding on chess.com. So uh, that's just really nice to hear and kind of makes us feel good about maybe seeing some more chess from him. He's the perfect personality to, to have in more of these chess events. He's awesome. Uh, you know, such a... Stalwart baseball player, two-time gold glove winner, also great on the offensive side. So uh, we look forward to seeing all of the Cleveland Guardians on the baseball diamond. For now, we are going to say goodbye. Amon, it's been an amazing time covering the action with you. We want to shout out all of the fans who stayed with us, whether you are from the baseball world or the chess world. We appreciate you all. And let's take a look back on a great first slug champs. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you soon.